special looks good. Probably not. Water towers fly! Yes! Ego down phenomenal. Why do you play a C dog? Bring it, that's the E dog. Oh. Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these. Yikes, you bet concur. What we do need more of is humans launching into space. And that is what we are about to get today. You're looking at a crew dragon atop a Falcon 9, ready to fly to the ISS with four people. I'm Jack Byer with NASA Space Flight, and I'm seeing a whole bunch of 5x5s in chat, so I know y'all can hear me okay. Excellent. And of course, for today's launch to the ISS, it's not just going to be me talking. I'm also joined by... My fellow NSF compatriots, first up, we've got Alex. Alex, what's up? Hey, everybody. How's do up? You, <laughs> do you, I just realized, do you prefer Alejandro or do you prefer Alex? Well, I don't mind Alex. It's, it's more English friendly. <laughs> so, so what I'm hearing is that you prefer Alejandro. I'll go with that. Cool. Well, thanks for joining us uh, on the Raptor side earlier today. We did a Raptor side chat. Um, and yeah, thanks for cool. joining us on this stream as well. Also, we've got Chris Gebhardt. Chris, you're out there in the field uh, with a camera. What's up? I, I am, but not the camera you're looking at. So spoilers, stay tuned. Uh, but yes, I am out here today too and ready for the launch of four crew members to the International Space Station. Always a good night when we're doing that. Excellent. And we've got you loud and clear, which is excellent because I know I'm going to be throwing you a bunch of questions from the chat, which we'll get to in a little bit. But first, we've also got out in the field a Miss Julia Bergeron. What's up, Julia? Why, hello there, Jack. Spoiler, I'm standing where Chris normally would stand. And the shot you're seeing right now is one I'm standing in front of. So something a little different tonight. Excellent. Well, uh, I'll be very curious to see what your presence where Chris normally is enables uh, us to get in terms of views from Chris. I wonder where he will be. I guess our viewers will just have to wait and find out what we have in store in that respect. Um, also, we might have Nick and Sweeney on comms. I'm not sure if we have him yet or not, but uh, he might also be popping in here for the duration, for the festivities, whatever you want to call it. And, of course, in the background, we've also got Michael Baylor pushing the buttons, pulling the levers, uh, you know, doing the things that make the stream work, which is pretty important, I would say. Fairly, somewhat, yes, really, really, it's really important. All right, well, with the introductions complete, I think it's time for the requisite mention that this is an interactive stream, and you can ask questions. Just type at NASA Spaceflight into chat. We'll see, this, uh, we'll see your question pop up in some nifty software that Michael wrote, and we'll be able to answer your questions, riff on your asking about what the lightning towers are, and uh, you know all that good fun stuff. So be sure to uh, pop into chat and at NASA Spaceflight if you have any questions you feel like asking. So, huh, yay, it's a launch day. Uh, we've got four hours <laughs> until launch. Wee! Um... What's We're everybody? already giddy. I mean, We're going to do well. <laughs> yeah, you know how if you're a long-time viewer or even potentially a relatively short-time viewer, you have an idea of how these things go when they're late at night. Uh, a little bit of, uh, of levity involved when staying up all hours of the night to catch rockets, but rest assured this is a serious situation. This is humans atop a rocket going into space. It's not just another internet rocket, right? So definitely want to underscore that even though we might get a little... Sleep deprived and giddy, we are taking seriously the fact that people are putting their lives on the line to travel into space tonight. So I think first up, I'll ask, uh, I'll ask Julia. Julia, how's the weather out there? It looks nice and clear. You know what? You are right. It is nice and clear. I see stars. I see a calm turn basin in front of me. And it is so calm that the mosquitoes can find me. Oh, darn it. Well, hopefully the mosquitoes get bored after a little while, or at least just full, and, and move on. Um, I'll take hope mosquitoes, though. It means that the wind is down, and that's always a good thing. Yeah, definitely. And hey, rockets. W would you trade mosquito bites for being close to a rocket launch? I would say, yeah, that's a no-brainer. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's all good. I'm happy. 
Excellent. All right, well, let's talk about the mission some. Chris, do you want to give us an overview of Crew 4, which is the mission that we're hoping to launch to the ISS tonight? Indeed I can. So Crew 4 is sort of as the name implies, the fourth operational crew flight for to the International Space Station for NASA under their commercial crew contract with SpaceX. Um, so fourth one for them, it will be launching four astronauts, three NASA astronauts, and one European Space Agency astronaut up to the International Space Station tonight. Uh, Shell Lendgren, a veteran, is our commander for the Crew 4 mission. He is joined by rookie Bob Hines, who will be the pilot. Both of them are NASA astronauts. And then mission specialist number one is Samantha Cristoforetti from the European Space Agency, also a veteran of a long duration flight along with Shell Lundgren. And then joining them is mission specialist two, Jessica Watson, who is a NASA astronaut making her first trip to space. And Jessica will become the first black woman to have a long duration stay on board the International Space Station. So all around a pretty fun crew. Um, their mission obviously will uh, involve hundreds of scientific experiments that will go on during their planned six-month stay aboard the orbiting laboratory. In particularly, uh, Samantha Cristoforetti is the third European astronaut in a row. Um, so continuing the permanent presence of Europeans on board the International Space Station that began last April with the launch of Thomas Pesquet on Crew 2. And uh, she will join Matthias Maurer on board the space station marking the first time since 2008 that two Europeans are up together on board the International Space Station. So um, all around, a really exciting mission. It is launching on the brand new Crew Dragon Freedom, which is the fourth and final capsule in NASA's Crew Dragon fleet. It joins the Endeavor, the Endurance, and the Resilience as, the, as rounding out the Crew Dragon fleet. Uh, and this will also be the fourth flight of this particular booster. It is B-1067, which launched the CRS-22 cargo mission to the International Space Station Crew-3 and a uh, TurkSat-5B. So uh, the same booster that launched Crew-3 is launching Crew-4 as well. So in a nutshell, that is our mission today going northeast from the Kennedy Space Center. So if it is clear up the eastern seaboard of the United States where you are in the Carolinas, Georgia, Virginia, Delaware, and New York areas, you have a pretty good shot of seeing first and second stage burns as Falcon 9 takes these four humans off the planet. So yeah, and you just answered a very common question we get. I'm already seeing several come in about where this will be visible from. So yeah, so where this is going to be visible from is largely based on your local cloud cover, but Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, the Vir Virginia, the D.C. area, up toward Delaware, Maryland, and up through New York have a good shot of seeing it if it is clear. Excellent. So Lucky Rail Productions, uh, if you're in North Carolina, good luck. You might, ha you might have a chance there. Um, yeah, let's see. And, the southern, and the southern states like Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas have a decent shot of seeing the entry burn as the first stage comes down to the drone ship that it will be landing on today as well. Very, oh, you just spoiled my next question. But Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> how dare you be informative, Chris? How dare you, sir? Uh, yeah, I'm too excited. See. You need to Nathan, give me parameters. Yeah, we've got Nathan asking if it'll be visible in Maryland. Will we have uh, Todd asking if it'll be visible in Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, pe people want to know if they'll be able to go outside and see this with their own two eyes. So thanks. So, that. so Puerto Rico, no. Uh, as much as I wish I could say that if we were going in a slightly different inclination, you'd have a really good shot. But no, unfortunately, too far away. So for this specific launch, I guess you could say Puerto Rico, no. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm. I really apologize. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see here. Well, I was going to ask Julia next up what is the deal with the booster recovery on this? Do we know what drone ship it's going out to? Do we know it's a drone ship landing, as Chris just said, but uh, what drone ship specifically is it going to, since you're our resident fleet expert there, Julia? Well, well, well. Um, we have a shortfall of Gravitas awaiting this booster, and Doug is the, well, I'd say tug, but it's not exactly a tug. Um, it's a multi-purpose ship and they have been waiting out there with all of these different delays, just kind of hanging out at that Northeast landing zone. Now, the thing is we will not have any fairing recovery, right? Because this is a capsule. 
Um, so just one ship and one drone ship. But do you want to hear a fun fact? No, I don't really like fun facts. Yes, I want to hear a fun fact. Wow. Okay. Besides the fact a helicopter just flew over me and I like those. Um, so we just had a capsule come in, right? But we also had just read the instructions leaving port only 19 hours after bringing a the ax. Oh, wait. No, that was Starlink. Wow. So many launches. Um, just read the instructions already went back out and they were only in port for 19 hours. So that means another launch is coming later on in the next week, which is crazy fast. I love this cadence. It's an excellent problem to have. That's for sure. All right, cool. So we know about we know about the booster that's launching it. We know where the booster is going after it detaches from the second stage. We know in general what's going on with the mission, but how about specifically during the launch? This is always a common question we get. Uh, people want to know if we're going to enter into the realm of jellyfish type effects since the launch is so early in the morning. Specifically, we've got Joshua Benchmol asking. Uh, you know, with 3.52 a.m. launch, will we get to see the jellyfish this morning? Mm, no. I, say, I, I hate to say so. Too early, right? No. Too early. Too early. We're not... yeah. yeah, the sun's not even given us any light quite yet. Yeah. That's the thing. Is we, get, we get asked that a lot, but it's because it's so cool. But it's it's important to remember when you do see it, it's extra special, not only because of how cool it is, but because of how rare that effect is. Exactly. Excellent. Um, really quick, thank you to Musical Wolves for the support. They say, what is that white marshmallow on top of the towering broomstick? That would be the human capsule thingy. Very technical term. Um, and see. I booped it earlier. I nice. did. Always boop the spacecraft. Oh, looks like That's we right. have imagery from inside the suit up area. Awesome. Oh, this Great is always see. fun. Yeah. Right. This this gives me like Apollo era vibes. Yep. Exactly. Um. And while we watch them do their, I think was this like leak checks and suit checkouts? What's going on here? Do we know? Yeah. 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 So this is um after they get into their suits, they do leak and pressure checks to make sure that they the suits can actually do everything that is intended in the event of an emergency. Uh, in the event that we would actually need those suits or that the crew would need those suits, they make absolutely sure that they are functioning perfectly before they walk out. Makes sense. You know what? Um, we were talking a little bit earlier before um, Chris left me. We saw emergency crews go past us, and that always reminds us of the gravity of the situation in case of emergency, right? So that yeah. is a very real thing to see ambulances pass by and go to their staging areas should there be something that they have to egress for. Yep, indeed. Uh, it, I'll say it again. Definitely want to underscore the seriousness of the situation. This is not just another commercial payload or a satellite, you know, or, or a bunch of Starlinks or what have you. Those, although the situation is serious in that too, because you know you don't want to mess up a customer payload. But this is humans. This is humans with human lives on the line, and uh, yeah, definitely important to to keep that in mind. Uh, Moldy space, thanks for the support. They say it got rear-ended today, but didn't let that get me down because this is the most important vehicle to keep safe today. Hashtag Basil's crew for all. I'm I wonder if that's a miss a mistype there, but Moldy space, I'm sorry you got rear-ended. Uh, cheer up, buddy. Uh, Musical Wolves for the Bug Spray Fund, thank you. And Todd Johnson, thank you for the support and for oh. the thanking us for the answer. Oh, the Bug Spray Fund is real tonight. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the Coffee coffee Fund, Bug Spray Fund. We have we have various fluid funds that are extremely important. So Yes. <laughs> um, it looks like we have Nick on comms now. Nick, are you there? Putting you on the spot. Well, I, I should be if everything's working correctly. If not, we'll have to talk to the uh, untrained monkeys who are running the show, namely myself. Oh, oh wow! Burn, self burn. Uh, chat, <laughs> give us a give us a five by five if uh, you can hear Nick. Okay, I can hear you just fine, Nick. So glad to have you on. Yeah, it's good to good to see the inside of the uh, crew prep room. That's a very historic room. Are you excited to see humans launch into space today? It's a trick question. I know he's going to answer yes. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm a little excited, just a little bit. Excellent. 
All right, well, uh, let's move on to some more questions. How about um, here? Here's one from Victor Campos. This is a great one. Uh, Victor says, test question. Good test. <laughs> and chat, chat is filling with five by five, so chat is hearing you just fine, Nick. Yay. Um, here we go. I, I'm, I'm Alex. I guess I, I should I should throw you a question since we haven't heard yeah. from you yet. Um, of yeah, course. I've been very quiet. <laughs> of, well, you're you're allowed to be. It's uh, and also I'm I could be a better host. Arr. Um, let's see. So Cosmic Mustache is asking: Is this mission under the original commercial crew contract? I'm just throwing this at you, expecting you to know it. Uh, uh but I expect yeah. you to know it. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, the extension comes. So the initial commercial crew contract. Uh, was Crew 1 through Crew 6, so all the way to Crew 6. And then they just recently added uh, Crew 7, Crew 8, and Crew 9. So there's going to be another three more coming down the line. And yeah, this this is from the from the original one. Very cool. All right, yeah, so original one you said covers all the way till Crew 6. Got it. And we're currently yep. looking at Crew 4. In the suit up room, prep room, whatever. It, Nick, is that a, is that an official term? What what, we, what are we what should we be calling this? You, you called it something fancy. Well, anyways. Um, let's see. Good question there. How about another question, Chris? Uh, yeah. So Jeet. I'm probably butchering your name. I apologize. Is asking, is there any maximum crew capacity to the ISS? In a way, yes. In a way, no. So, uh, so normal crew capacity of seven, you can surge that, like we just saw for several weeks with um, with the Axiom crew, which expanded that up to eleven crew members. That's about as much as the ISS can can really handle from its. Um, from its life support and commodity systems perspective, you can surge for brief periods of time, but then you've got to sort of get back down to that baseline normal. Got it. That makes sense. Um, let's see. We're getting some good questions tonight. Way to go, y'all. Never failing to disappoint. Um, let's see. Austin Skirvin is asking, what is that one white tower? Which we can't see right now because we're looking at the suit-up room, but uh, they say wrong answers only. So I'm going to say that big, large, singular white tower on top of the tower at 39A is a large cigarette. That's my answer. My wrong answer. <laughs> it's a magic wand. Get it right. <laughs> oh, that's way better. Let's go with magic wand. Um, let's see. Oh, I didn't show it on screen. There we go. Now it's on screen. Yay. Michael Seeley. That that name seems familiar. What's up, Michael? <laughs> Michael Seeley. Wait, I'm just gonna turn around and yeah. wave at him. Like Yeah, wave, wave at Michael, <laughs> who's also Hi, out Michael. there <laughs> photographing tonight, I'm sure. Uh they say, is this mission carrying animal experiments? Is this an in joke between you and Michael, or is this uh is this something going on here that I didn't I didn't read about yet? Wait, are there dragonflies on this mission? Chris? Um, yeah, Chris, I'm looking at you, buddy. <laughs> oh, sorry. I, I had to work something with my rig. What was the question? Are there Michael... dragonflies? Actually on the capsule? Yeah. Oh, good question. I don't know if they're launching with them or if they've are if they're already there. That's a good question. But... I Oh, okay, so we think as part of this mission, there are dragonflies involved. We do, but I don't okay. believe that they are on this capsule. There's very I mean, little you... that they can take up with them on, on crew flights. There is some cargo capability, but it's very minor on crew I mean, flights. Julia, do you mean they're involved in that like crew dragon will fly through some dragonflies and embed them on the vehicle itself in the same way that <laughs> cr like dragonflies are involved with my Land Rover when I drive down the highway? What are you talking oh, about? Oh, that's so, so sad. But yeah, no, I do believe. 
<laughs> oh, you're you're breaking my heart because the dragonflies were indeed out today, which means they are still out tonight. And um, no, I am actually referring to I do believe dragonflies in flight might be an experiment on the space station during their mission. And we've got a few hours, so I will see if we can look into that. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I I know dragonflies are so cool. I'm sorry. I I I hit you with out of the blue with that one. Okay, uh, well then I'll give you another fun fact. There, I, I have like a dragonfly facts. tattoo. So there you go. Nice. I did not know that. Now I do. Now everybody does. So okay. So Michael Seeley, if you're listening, come over and tell Chris G what the deal is with the with your question here, because I suspect. I, I mean, I you put us on the spot, buddy. I mean, come on. Um, let's see here. Yeah, it, it's it's also um, yeah. So there's a, there's also like the the meaning behind dragonfly because it's a symbol of change and transformation and like self realization, all of which are sort of the goals of the research that's done on board the International Space Station as well. So there's a nice connection there as well. Makes sense. Yep. I, I'm I'm still just thinking about the cool dragonfly photos I saw pre-launch. That was really nifty. Mm -hmm. Um. Space fan, Space fan New Zealand is asking if the crew access arm is not attached to the Dragon capsule. It was. I think it might have just been the angle of the camera when you, when they asked that question. And it looks like we're getting up and walking around the, the prep room here. That's some good signs. Yeah, they probably completed the the leak checks. Yeah. And getting ready for, for walkout. Excellent. This That's might be where we find out where Chris G is. Oh, I dun, just spoiled dun, dun. it. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned for more exciting developments in NASA spaceflight. Uh, Intent. Okay, here's one for Adrian. Or Adrian, oh my god, my brain. Need more coffee. Here's one for Alex. Uh, I'm European, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit different countries. A <laughs> little bit, yeah. Spain and Spain versus Germany. Uh, I can't. I can't imagine Germans taking a siesta. Is there a German word for siesta? I don't think so, das, but if there is, das, it's probably yes, a long, a long word for that. Flugensgruben, <laughs> schmini, <laughs> yeah, et cetera. Um, <laughs> we need to ask Adrian next time. Yeah, we do. Adrian, what's the longest word for nap you can get us auf Deutsch? Uh, here's, one for, here's one for you, though, Alex. Uh, okay. Mace Bob is, is asking, does Falcon 9 only steer with gimbal during stage one and two of ascent? How does Falcon 9 steer? Is it just gimbals? Is it gimbals and cold gas thrusters? How does that work? Yeah, so during first stage ascent and in like, okay, <laughs> I got to rephrase that. During first stage ascent, they use the TVC, the gimbals on the on the first stage engines. That's enough for them. But during uh, second stage, because it only has one single engine, that that can only get you uh, yaw and pitch control, but not roll control. So what they use is a set of cold gas thrusters, which can also help for yaw and pitch, but they are primarily for for roll control. Um, so yeah, like they and once the engine is off for both the stages, they use the the RCS thrusters on the first stage for reorienting uh, for reentry. And once it's down uh, through the through the atmosphere, it kind of helps steer a little bit. But they use primarily the grid fins for that. And for the second stage, you know, when once the engine is off, everything has to be controlled by the coal gas thrusters, obviously, because you don't have any sort of power on the engine, so you you cannot control it with with gimbal. It's I I mean, you you could probably move the engine, but it won't it won't get you anything, right? Yeah. I mean, you could like do a cool meme video and put like that wiggle, that song is like wiggle, wiggle, wiggle you know, something like that. Get you that. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> um, let's see here. Chris, do you want to go over the crew members for this one again? Since we're watching the crew in their uh, in their suit up room here, we've got yes, Sam's Warrior sixteen asking about the crew members on this flight. Yes, indeed. So Crew 4 is an international flight with three NASA astronauts and one European Space Agency astronaut. Uh, it is commanded by Shell Lendgren, who joined NASA in 2007 and made his first and so far only flight to space in July of 2015 aboard the Soyuz TMA-17 mission, where he served as a um, 
a member of the Expedition 24 uh, crew for the International Space Station. Um, oh, I'm sorry, where he served as, a, where he joined Expedition 44, um, 44, um, and then continued on for a 141-day stay in space before landing in Kazakhstan. After that, he commanded the NEMO-22, the undersea sort of, NASA's undersea laboratory off the coast of Florida. He commanded the NEMO-22 mission on that and is now set to be the commander for Crew 4. Joining him is U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Bob Hines, uh, who will serve as the pilot on this mission. It is his first trip to space, and he was selected back in 2017 as an astronaut candidate as part of Group 24, along with Jessica Watson. Um, so this will be his first flight to space, and he will serve as the flight engineer for Expedition 67 and 68. Um, joining them as mission specialist number one is European Space Agency astronaut Samantha Christopher Reddy. Uh, she is Italian by birth and making her second trip to space. Uh, she was chosen as an astronaut in 2009 and launched on her first mission on the Soyuz TMA-15M mission in November of 2014 as part of the Expedition 42 and 43 crews aboard the station. Uh, she stayed in space for 199 days on that flight. And um, many of you probably remember there is a very, there's a picture that does the rounds of a female astronaut dressed as Captain Janeway in Captain Janeway's uniform as a dragon is grabbed mm. by the station's robotic arm. And that is Samantha Christopher Reddy. And she has promised us that she has brought another science fiction uniform on this flight, but we have to wait to see what it is. Um, so Nice. Uh, yeah, indeed, indeed. And then rounding out the crew um, for them today is mission specialist number two, Jessica Watson. Sorry, Watkins, Jessica Watkins. Um, and she will be making her first trip to space. She was, like Bob Hines, uh, a member of the 2017 Group 22 NASA astronaut group and has a doctorate in geology from UCLA. Um, and she was a science team member on the Mars Curiosity rover before she was selected as a NASA astronaut. Um, so, uh, she also participated in the NEMO 23 underwater expedition in 2019. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, she will be the first black woman to stay and live aboard the international space station and just the second black person to perform a long duration stay on board the international space station. So that is our crew for today. And they will be, uh, Joining the seven people who are already on board the International Space Station, particularly they are going up to have about a, a, a week-ish of handover with the Crew 3 astronauts of Rajashari. Um, uh, sorry, that, that would be Rajashari, Kayla Barron, Matthias Maurer, and um, oh my gosh, why am I blanking on his third name, the pilot on that mission? Tom Marshburn. Um, uh, so they will be going up and doing some handover. One, we're T minus three hours, 35 minutes. Crew suit donning and checkouts are complete. We're on schedule. Okay, and they look finished. And there we go. They are done, and that concludes our who are the crew for this mission as well. So perfect timing. Nice, excellent work, Chris. Uh, I immediately have two questions. Again, I want to point out something interesting Please. about the crew. Yeah. Um. So yesterday, at least for me, because here is is already Wednesday. Uh. Yesterday was Samantha's birthday on Tuesday. So yes. she she's basically getting a big candle for, for her birthday. <laughs> Would that be one big candle or nine small candles and then one candle later, mm. like eight minutes That's later? That's a good question. Uh, and one to grow on. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, and then we'll see them coming out of this door here shortly. Gotta love it. Yes, and maybe... We'll reveal where I am. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Uh, oh, I wonder if we can see you in this shot. Oh, you can see me in that shot, actually. Oh, oh my Chris, goodness. Hey. Hi, wherever Hi. that is. You can see me in that shot. Yep, okay. <laughs> that's awesome. So that's nice. where I am. <laughs> with, one, with one of our rigs to bring you uh, a little bit more personal and up-close view of the crew getting into their Teslas before they head out to the launch pads here. Excellent. Thank you for that. And then you're going to be able to to head back over to where Julia is after this, right? Very much. In fact, hi. Like, 
<laughs> That's actually me right there. Uh, I, I'll turn and wave in a second. <laughs> nice. Oh, yeah, don't you love the lag, wow, Chris? But yeah, that's me. <laughs> so there you go, waving at the camera. So yeah, it's always Very exciting. Cool. The, the last time I was actually at a crew walkout was one thirty-five, the final shuttle flight. So it's very nice to be back for another one. Well, wow. so that's yeah, that's a special day for you. Yeah, we haven't been able to do it since because of the pandemic. So very nice to be here for this one. Yay. I immediately have a question, uh, since you were talking about the whole science fiction uniform thing. Do you know, I'm putting you on the spot here, how much weight is each ISS crew member, like personal weight oh. allocated on a mission? That's a great question. I don't know the actual weight limit on like personal effects. I know it's very small, so they have to be very judicious in what they take. So when they take these sort of fun things up with them, like it does sort of count against that um, in terms of, you know, what, what they, what they can bring up for personal effects, but it's small, but it's not like insignificantly small in terms of the Got total it. mass. Yeah. If anyone knows in chat, uh, drop that. Uh, I would love to know what the, what everyone's weight allocation is. So, so what you're saying is, is if I was going to the ISS, I probably wouldn't, be allowed to bring my six inch by six inch cube of tungsten, which is very heavy. Probably not. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't have a six inch by six inch cube of tungsten. I was going to say, you're getting in touch with your inner Borg there. <laughs> so in touch with it. Um, <laughs> and then because I get to ask my own questions, I just get to, sorry, y'all. Um, you talked about how this mission has two mission specialists. Yes. I mean, I figure it might just make a little sense to go over, you know, what is a mission specialist? Please explain. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, it, it is basically the NASA nomenclature of these are trained professional astronauts who are not the commander or the pilot. Um, so they are the mission specialist on the flight. We have seen other designations like on some of the, like on Inspiration4, uh, Haley Arsenault was the chief medical officer on the flight, something that NASA does not normally have um in that regard uh, on their flights but it's basically just they're they're not the commander they're not the pilot they they need some sort of you know indicator for who they are so on the flight so mission specialists makes sense and all of the families have just arrived um out front to um getting ready to say goodbye to their loved ones um well, how about getting ready to say see people you later? Are going to come stand right in front of my camera, so I don't know how much of a shot I'm going to have now. Oh, well, I'll let you uh, jump off comms and wiggle around if you need to. Um, but definitely cool to see the families out there for the launch. But yeah, I wouldn't say they're saying goodbye to the crew members. I'd say they're 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 saying see you later. How about that? We'll get all philosophical, like probably yeah. bon voyage on a fun adventure. There we go. I like that way better, Nick. Uh, really quick, before we get too far behind, Musical Wolves, thank you for the support. They say, can Falcon 9 do an ISS launch with a booster RTLS? Alex. Ooh, that's... I don't... Uh, I, ex uh, I expect you to go simulate it in it Flight depends. Club right now. <laughs> yeah, do check that out, because it's really a good resource. Uh, but it depends on the on the payload. Uh, Dragon missions right now, Dragon 2 is not like Dragon 1. Dragon, was, Dragon 1 was... Uh, more lighter, you know, it was able to uh, to return, like, they were able to return the booster back because the, the Dragon itself was lighter. Even when, when it was, like, filled to the brim with payload, it was still light enough uh, to be able to return the booster back. But now with Dragon 2, it's heavier. And so uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't allow them to be able to return back to, to the launch site and have enough performance on the second stage to then go into orbit with that dragon. So they have to to burn a little bit a little bit more fuel and land on the drone ship. Gotcha. Well, thanks for that. And I love we get to see Chris moving hastily moving the camera right now. Way to go, Chris. <laughs> um, let's see here. Don't want to get too far behind cuz we're like 15 minutes old on this one. Josh, thank you so much for one waiting and two for the support. They said wanted to work, ask during the Axe One undock, but couldn't. Didn't they hear? Didn't 
hear ISS ring the bell for dock undock of Acts 1? Is this not something that happens with private missions, or did I just miss it? What is this What is this ringing the bell thing? Does, oh, this is not something I, I know yeah. about off the top of my the head. The naval tradition, yeah. Hmm. Oh, Chris, uh, sounds like your mobile oh, yeah. cable might be getting close to your, your pack cables there, but what, what were you saying? It's a, it's a oh, naval so, tradition? Oh, yeah, sorry. It's a, it's a naval tradition. Um, you ring a bell when a ship arrives into port, and you ring the bell and announce its departure. Um, they do typically do that on the International Space Station. It is just not always broadcast live over NASA TV. Got it. Well, thank you for the question there, Josh. Space Guy T.Y., Space Guy Ty, good name there. Thank you for becoming a Capcom member. This is the part where I say thank you to all of our members, especially thank you to our new members, Space Guy Ty, the newest of the members. And he's a Capcom member, or they're a Capcom member, so they come in and they get uh, Discord access. So enjoy the Discord access there, Space Guy Ty. Thank you to all of our members. We could not do what we do without you. And what we do includes putting cameras anywhere we can put cameras for space flight related events. So this camera that you are seeing right now, this shot is from Chris B, or sorry, Chris G. <laughs> oh, my brain. <laughs> well, I've been very weird. Yeah, There's I so think I can see Bill Nelson there, there, right? Wait, wait. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, so right in front of me is uh, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson and Bob Cabana and then a whole bunch of other NASA bigwigs. Yes. Nice. <laughs> Let's see. So, yeah, thank you, Chris, hey. for being able to bring us that shot. And thank you for our members for enabling us to do stuff like this. Julia, what's up? I just wanted to share with you that um, one of my Twitter followers, Kay Taylor, has been listening in. And we have an answer about how much personal, um, the weight of the personal items you can bring is 3.3 pounds or 1.5 kilograms for personal preference items. And um, that's the closest we've found so far. And that uh, also goes for the Soyuz. So. Wow, ah, that's like way less than I expected. But also, I don't know why I expected it to be anything more than that. Oh, God. Would, would that include like laptops and stuff? Because like, geez. No, no. So that would, in and that wouldn't include clothing or anything like that. These are like pictures, mementos of family, um, if they choose flags, to bring wedding things rings, like that. flags, yeah, things like that, yeah. Okay, nice. I wonder if it, like, what the volume constraint becomes. Like, can I bring three pounds of marshmallows? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I thought it was funny. Fine. Um, let's see. Really quickly, Musical Wolves again. Thank you, Musical Wolves. If SpaceX is ready early, will they send spend... What is it? If SpaceX is ready early, will they full send 90 minutes early for more sleep? I don't think they can do that. They'll probably stick to the schedule, huh? Yeah. Is it something right. about orbital mechanics or something, maybe? But sleep is nice. Sleep good. <laughs> As someone who doesn't get enough of it, I can confirm sleep good. Um, Michelle Pierce, thank you for the support. They say, I got up at 2 a.m. and I'm up already. Or, oh, I got home from work at 2 a.m. and I'm up already. He, here's to a coffee, here's, a, here's to a coffee toast to all of us. I swear I can talk. Uh, thank you so much for Michelle for the support there. Paul, ooh, we got two new Capcoms. We got Paul and Michelle Pierce. So thank you, Paul, and thank you, Michelle Pierce. Again, membership program. The viewership of our videos on YouTube is heavily influenced by the algorithm. And the uh, membership program helps even out all of the vagaries of the YouTube algorithm and really helps us support what we do. So here we go. We got, they're coming down the elevator. They're about to walk out in, in front of Chris's camera. Yes, indeed they are. This is always fun. The shots of them getting in the elevator and the elevator door closing. That's, this is all like classic going to space day. Classic Apollo going to space stuff. Yes, indeed. It's always epic when they come up from, from those doors. Such a long history. Yeah, it's it, something about this. It's just quite special. Yeah. You're right. It's, it's, it's that moment of you... Um, 
you know, you, 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 you're, you're thinking back on history just as much as you're looking forward to the new launch, right? And, and, and the new stuff that they are going to do on board the station. But at the same point, you're remembering all the crews who walked out of this same building and walked down this same ramp and down that same elevator, just went out to different vehicles uh, and went to their and went to their rockets on their pads. You also really do think back in times like this. Uh, looking for some more questions. Where did that go? I can't find it anymore. It just disappeared on me. Someone was asking, I'm sorry, I can't find your name right off the top of my head here, but someone was asking, why is there the armored personnel carrier behind the Teslas? Because crew safety is paramount, not just in terms of their safety on the rocket and their safety on the mission, but protecting them from potential threats here on the ground before they lived off. Makes sense. Yeah, I think we can see some heavily armed individuals as well over there. Um, Musical Wolves asking, what are the plate numbers for tonight? We've seen some interesting plates on the Teslas for crew launches. I don't know that we have eyes on them yet, but that's something to keep an eye out for, right? Or did you have you seen it, Chris? Sorry, what? Sorry, I was sorry. I was I was getting a message on on the back channel. What was that, Jack? Did you get uh, did you get a look at the at the plates for the Teslas? Uh, no, they're facing the other way. Got it. All right, let's see here. Sounds like we're getting audio from location, which is super cool. So we'll keep an eye out for the Tesla plates as they drive off. You can see the doors are now opening up. Like being quiet in case the crowd goes woo or something. <laughs> Yeah, they're about to to walk out. All right, I'm just gonna I'm just I'm just gonna go for it. Uh. Ooh, there they are! Woohoo! Here they come. Yeah. <laughs> I like I like the show of support from everybody on site, you know, the the applause, the the hooting, the hollering. There it is. I can hear it now. I love it. I'm just enjoying listening. <laughs> Whoever that guy is on the left that got up on like a step stool, he's not what's up. Is that Craig? Now you can see one of NASA's cameras. I'm looking closely for Chris G in this shot. But really, astronauts. That's what I'm looking at. I'm really hoping if we see, we get to see the the plates on the cars. They usually have some some funny thing going on. Yeah, I'm trying to I'm keeping my eye open. I don't quite see it yet, but we'll, I'm sure we'll get eyes on it at some point here. Um, here's some sort of an orbital mechanic -y type question, whoever wants to jump on this one. Dirty Hippie is <laughs> asking, do they wait for the ISS to fly directly over the launch site and have the rocket take off and chase it down? How does this rendezvous work? Oh, that's a good question. I can answer that. Go for it. Um, 
it's not the eye set, it's, it's the eye set's orbit. And so, you know, um, the orbit is like in a plane that cuts the Earth, and as the Earth rotates underneath that plane, they have to launch into that plane. Now, the ISS could be anywhere in that orbit. Uh, so, the the ideal is that um, if it's close to the launch, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if it's close to the launch site at lift at liftoff, that means you get you get there faster. So that usually like where in the orbit the ISS is when the orbit comes above the launch site is usually what determines the the sort of the, the timeline for the rendezvous. Got it. So yeah. Yeah. So it's not it's not really a chase down sort of thing, it's more of like a wait for the plane to be overhead sort of thing. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Yeah, you gotta you gotta chase the, the plane actually. And then once you're into the into the same plane, then you can change. You you can go higher, you can go lower, whatever you want, you know. And that that'll help you chase the the ISS. And sometimes, um, if you go higher than the ISS orbit, it actually it's actually the ISS that catches you up. <laughs> so that's yeah. It depends I on that the from sort of rendezvous. Kerbal Space Program. Yep, yep. KSP. That helps you a lot. Um, let's see, Eric Frazier said, Trevor Malman posted a pic a bit ago with a plate that said, go for launch. Not sure if that was from today, so that might be one of them at least. Um, let's see. And the, the crew are already on the, oh, go for launch. Yep. The plates are called go for launch. Yeah, okay, so Trevor was right. Good stuff. Shout out to awesome photographer Trevor Mullen. What's up, Trevor? Here's, a, here's another one as they're in the Teslas and getting ready to roll out. Uh, what happens to the suits after each mission since they're custom made? The, I mean, I don't imagine they get to just take the suits home and like wear them for Halloween or something, which is what Sens Warrior 16 suggested. Um, the the suits I think they use it, they use them for for training later, because they are custom suit uh, suits, but they can sort of like fit, if, like if you if you small and the suit is from another astronaut that was a small that kind of fits you for training, like you don't really need a suit that is fully custom made for you for for training. Now for flight, obviously you will get your own suit. But for for training, they usually use these uh, already used suits for you to wear, uh, so they don't need to make like some training suit or of sorts. So yeah, I think they, they explained yeah. that a few times already. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Glenn Hobson, thanks for the support. They say great to have a launch during the day here in Australia. Here's some dollar dollaroos. I would say dollary dues, but I'm also not from Australia. And there they go. There we go. I think it was like a four mile trip to the to the pan. Sorry, I was only like crying when Farmer was saying. All right, so a, a nice quick trip. But can't yeah. they only go like thirty miles an hour or something? They don't. They don't race in those fast Model Xs, do they? I know the speed limit on site at Kennedy Space Center uh, on like some of the big long straightaways is I think 50 or 55, but maybe they go slower for like extra safety reasons or something. I'm not sure. That's a good question. Also, what, um, what, what soundtrack are they listening to? That, that would be my question. <laughs> the soundtrack to Armageddon. Nice. <laughs> Um, and SOCOM3, thank you for the support. They say, what's the trajectory looking to get in position for a good photo? I'm not sure what, how to answer that. Like, where do you need to be yes. on the ground track to get yeah, a good photo? Yeah, I guess photo? They're, they're asking about that. I'm not sure. Well, you can use Flight Club for that. <laughs> I know a lot of photographers use that. Yeah, Flight yeah. Club indeed rules for that sort of thing. Um, SOCOM, if I'm misunderstanding your question, feel free to tag me in chat, and I'll see if I can see it pop up. But thank you for the support, bud. Is this a view from the from the cars? That's neat. 
I don't think we have had this kind of view like from the front. I, I think we we've had some overhead shots in previous launches, but yeah, this is cool. Yeah, like, you had, like, like your helicopter hailing them, almost like, yeah. a, like a pursuit or something. But no, this is like you're in the <laughs> car. This is really cool. We're in pursuit. <laughs> Poor astronauts going into space. <laughs> I'm just getting flashbacks to being a kid and see, like wa watching all the episodes of, on Fox TV of like world's deadliest pursuits and stuff like that. <laughs> Um, let's see. Julia. SpaceX Edits is asking, can you see the Starship pad from your location? The Starship pad? No. Well, no. You, w you will be able to once it rises high enough, right? Right. Once it's tall enough, I'll be able to see it. It's just not tall enough quite yet. And we actually could barely see it from the positions we set our cameras at at remote set. So... I don't think you'll get any sneak peeks of it in any of our remote cameras. Sorry. Got it. So have they sort of altered the remote setup spots to uh, to limit views of that area of the pad? Is that sort of a strategic thing that's happened? Um, let's just say that, yes, the ground cover does a very good job of hiding it right now. And we just do not go inside of the pad because there's a lot of construction movement going on. Got it. I wonder what remotes will be like for Falcon Heavies if they'll let us in. Because some of those really, really good spots were inside the pad spots. Hmm. Uh, there's a lot of heavy equipment there, just like Boca Chica. So, ew. Makes sense. But, Julia, in Boca Chica, we can go right up to the things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Isn't that right, Nick? That is very right. I was just there a minute ago. Beautiful. But Boca Chica is not Kennedy Space Center where they might just have a little bit different liability waivers. They probably do. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, good question from SpaceX Edits there. Sean Jeffries is saying, hi guys, watched you for years now. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, they say, what is the Raptor chat with Alejandro that you mentioned at the start of the stream. Thanks. Uh, sorry, it took us 27 minutes to get to your question there, but um, we do a thing, or we are starting to do the thing again called Raptor Side Chats, where we uh, basically commentate on a 24-7 live stream that we have, Starbase Live. Uh, rather than spooling up a whole entire separate stream, it's kind of a more informal, like, hang out with us and chat a little bit in Starbase. You can ask us to point the cameras at certain things and all that good stuff, so... There was a Raptor side chat today. I'm not sure if it's still in the buffer for Starbase Live. I think it is. I'm not sure. I um, think it's still up. Yeah. It was at 2 p.m. Central, if you want to scroll back. Yeah, so if you go back to Starbase Live, 2 p.m. Central, although by the end of the stream, it might have been mm. exhausted from the buffer. So uh, what we are putting those up for members, I am going to say that out loud so that we have to do it because I want to do it because I think it's a cool idea. So... The first yeah. one is uploading to YouTube now. If it's not live already, it will be soon. So if you're a YouTube member, you'll get access to the Raptor side chats after the fact in case you don't have the ability to uh, join in uh, in the moment. So that's kind of another little new member perk sort of thing going on there. Uh, I also had uh, a tweet from Elon live. It was like, oh, he just tweeted. So yeah, we were talking about yeah. all of that. Yeah, that was uh, that was really nifty. We had, were just like talking about the new Raptor Wrangler shirt. Which shout out, we have a new Raptor Wrangler yeah. shirt. We also have a, another new shirt, but I don't think we're going to show it just yet because we're looking at this convoy go down the road. But consider yourselves out there, viewers, listeners, consider yourselves warned. There is, there is another. Is that is that a sufficient Star Wars reference? There is another. All, I don't know. Always Star Wars references here. I love that. Excellent. Um, I wonder if the person operating this camera is sneezing continuously or if it's just like really windy up there or what's going on, but we're watching the convoy come down the road. If, if I had to guess that poor person was just dealing with some wind because, oh boy, does that happen from time to time with me? <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Wind bad. All the wind. It yeah, makes I'm me want now. a big box lens and like big heavy sled like you would use in live sports, like just the chonkest possible setup, but then... You're not mobile. 
but exactly. rrr, wind. What are you gonna say, Alex? Oh yeah, no, I, w I was looking through through our Discord server, and I'm seeing uh, a few names that we have mentioned here on the chat, uh, and they are coming in, and you know, as we usually do, we always welcome people to our to our Discord uh, server. So if you're Capcom or above, you have access to our Discord server. So yeah, if if you're already and you're not in the server, please do come in. We welcome you. Um, and if you're not, well, you're missing it. So how are you doing? <laughs> you're missing it. <laughs> yeah, I just posted my customary Forrest Gump wave. Yeah. GIF. So there you go. Mission I'm complete. so M excited. I can hear the helicopter getting closer to us here at the press site. They're just awesome. down they're the gonna, road. They're going to come right by you, right, Julia? They're going to sort of scoot right by you and head to the pad? Right, they are. And so hopefully my tracking, which, y'all, I don't normally do videos. So I'm hoping that my tracking is better than the tracking that you all were seeing. And I'm thinking with the helicopter where it is, they might be turning the corner very soon. Excellent. Ooh. Well, we'll keep an eye for the camera to switch to your shot. And I'm sure it'll be great. And as Nick said, woohoo! Um, SOCOM is asking north or south launch pad. They clarified their question, and I'm still confused. I apologize. I think they're uh, asking about the trajectory, right, Julia? Um, I see lights, by the way, so this is going to happen soon. Um, they are, if you're talking the difference between 39A and 39B, 39B no, actually, is to it's, the it's, north. I misread. It's path, trajectory. not pad. So they're, oh, they're going okay. North, we're, going, right? yeah. we're going northeast. Yep. Oh. Excellent. Hey, y'all, hopefully, can see a helicopter and some lights coming my way. The view will oh, get better the right as they turn. get closer. And I'm sure there's some delay on the NASA feeds, so they're probably coming up on you, like, right now, Julia. Don't don't even talk. You got this. You got the track. We believe in you. There's only... Bu -bu -bu 2,000 people watching. <laughs> I do believe I see Tesla's coming our way. Awesome. And they're... They're driving past the VAB now, and they're heading down the road that uh, is next to the crawler way towards 39A. What is, uh, what's, this is, this is your shot, huh, Julia? Nice. Yeah, that's Very my nice. shot. Very nice shot. Ooh, uh, the oh, the you, nice. yeah. And there they go. Off to 39A. <laughs> Off to space. Right? Love it. All right, so this is the point of the stream where I'm going to ask everybody, what are you excited for most in this uh, pre-launch sequence? How about? not? So you, you can't say you're most excited for launch itself, but I'm saying up until... The moment of launch. What is everybody most excited for tonight? As we, because uh, I mean, this is Crew Four now. Plus, we've had um, the Inspiration Four mission, and we've had Axiom One. So we've had a fair share of crew missions. We kind of know what the game plan is and what to expect. What's everyone looking forward to tonight on the stream? And sort of what can our viewers know what to look forward to as uh, as we get closer to exactly three hours away from launch? We're at three hours four minutes right now. Um, oh, I, Alex, I can't go, wait for the Pad Ninjas. Those are my favorite. Definitely. <laughs> All right, I'll, that's a valid answer for sure. Alex, what are you? Uh, what are you excited for? Well, not really super super excited in the sense of oh yeah, this is super cool. But I'm more like um, looking forward to the little traditions when the when the crew arrives to the to the pad. Like one of the first things they do is look up to the to the rocket that's super cool like you're basically like like an ant next to the <laughs> to the rocket and then when they go up they call people on the telephone up in 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 the crew access arm level and then they sign the white room at the crew access arm i like those little you know traditions that they that they follow yeah <laughs> yeah the little traditions are definitely super cool um julia what are you looking forward to well, um, 
I always look forward to the phone, to be honest. The phone is very sentimental to me. Mm. And I thought I thought it was very special that um, Elon decided to save it and move it up to the crew access arm at this level. So that's my favorite part. Um, yeah. And if you guys are wondering what we're talking about, if you've missed it on previous launch streams, we will definitely be talking about that phone a little bit more. But uh, yeah, there is a phone on the launch tower and we will see the crew use it. And we'll talk about it a little bit more in a little bit when they're using it. Um, for me, I'm excited for comms check because I love mm -hmm. hearing the Quindar tone that like beep boop. I love that so much. Can you do that again? It that was like the perfect, that was the perfect tone there. <laughs> you have my you have my permission, Nick, to make that into your text tones. Beep boop. There you go. All right, we'll do. We'll do. Uh, let's see. Musical wolves, thank you so much. They say like is go for pressing, or like button is go for pressing. That's hilarious. Thank you. I mean, it's it's a like YouTube cliche, you know. Oh, hit the like button, subscribe. But really, it is super helpful um, to indicating to the YouTube algorithm overlord that you like what we do. Uh, and getting our stuff out there, because if you want us to keep doing what we're doing, it's good that people keep watching our stuff. Um, so thank you, Musical Wolves. Smash someone the like button if y'all are so inclined. Someone just mentioned in chat, uh, RoboJack. Yeah, we, I we, saw that, that and that's I was like, of, yeah. It, it it gave me mild anxiety for a second, like, oh god, is my internet connection <laughs> failing? Um, but no, they just meant because I was saying beep boop. Uh, so thanks for that mild jolt of anxiety there john and alex uh <laughs> Zaucom or socom again says thank you new england will be or northeast will be a great arc photo also milky way will be fully up at launch i do astrophotography cool well good luck with your photo there buddy um let's do some more questions i sure hope we get chris g back i already miss him and we've got three hours to go well, I hope he comes back. I hope we didn't scare him off. <laughs> oh, man. I see the Candyman saying I'm coming in considerably quieter than the others. Uh, I, If I am, I can do something to adjust it. Let me know. Oh, they just uh, arrived. Yeah. Yep, and there they are, arriving at the pad. They got the horizontal integration facility on their left. Ooh. And they're climbing up the ramp now in the Teslas. They don't really mess around there. It's not like they have to stop for a stop sign or a traffic light at all. They just keep moving, huh? Let's see what we got here. Some more questions as we watch them arrive at the pad and disembark and do that whole look up at the awesome rocket thing and look at that we got the we got the car view again i love this it's a whole entirely different perspective that first person sort of perspective like if you were in the car that's what you would be seeing right now i love it cars just are super small compared to the rocket that that really gives you an idea of the sheer size of, of this rocket Right? And Falcon 9 is what? A uh, like 12 story building or 20 story building? I always forget what the what the metric is there, but it's a very well, tall building either way. <laughs> 70 meters for the for the non-imperial folks. <laughs> and non story we only do, metric. We only do freedom units. units here. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> I promise I'm not that annoying actually. I'm just joking. Uh let's see. Looking for some more questions. I had a couple lined up just for Chris. It's like, aw. Um, here's one. SpaceX Edits is asking, what is the quickest Dragon turnaround so far? That's a, probably a question for Alex, huh? Oh, you know what? I actually don't have data on that. I, I need a spreadsheet for that. I have many spreadsheets. And Jack, you, you can tell I do. <laughs> like, you, you could probably corroborate that. Uh, but I don't have one for, for Dragon. I do know it's sort of like in the four month, five month time frame, sort of like the shortest one. Uh, but this one is a new dragon. So we, we, we're not really uh, in that situation where we should be like, oh, this is this one being reused or something. This this one is new. 
So, yeah. Got it. Vatasiana in chat is saying 20 days, they think, but that sounds really short to me. That that might be a booster statistic. I think we yeah. reached, I think we've reached 19 or 20 days on a booster now. For booster reuse? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was like 26 or 24 or something like that. 27. I can actually look it up and tell say, you the exact one. He's got the spreadsheet for that. Yeah. Yeah, I do have a spreadsheet for that. It's 27 days, 4 hours, and 4 minutes for B1060 between its 4th and 5th flights, um, which were Turksat 5A and Starlink uh, 18 back in early 2021. Wow. That is incredibly specific. Okay, so do we think that we will get... Do you think we'll beat that this year? I'm guessing by the latest booster return that that is their goal. Because yeah. this one flew off the barge and, and back on that stand at 5.30 in the morning. Wow. We're actually having that later this week. We have B-1062, which launched Axiom 1 just two weeks ago. And it's going to launch this Friday, we hope. But we'll see how the, how the schedules hold. But we have a Starlink launch this Friday, and it's going to be launching on the same booster. Just three weeks after Axiom 1 launched, just three wow. Fridays before. That's hey, going to be a, a record. You know what, Alex? I just noticed something. When I came uh -huh. to the media center today, which was, you know, about 1030 tonight, I looked at Launch Complex 40, and guess what? There was a TE that was vertical. And mm. guess what? It's mm. not vertical anymore. So what does that mean, Alex? Because now I do not oh. see a TE. Okay, so what that means is that when... The rocket launches, you know, the, the, the Stromback retracts and it's like the throwback maneuver that they call. And basically it detaches from the launch mount, the reaction frame. Uh, it's the name that SpaceX uses. And, and so when they, when they want to roll it back to the hangar, they need to pick it up. And so they raise vertical the, the, the Stromback. They uh, bolt it down to the, to the reaction frame and now they can detach it and roll it back to the hangar so they can install the rocket and, and the payload and then it rolls out and it's ready for launch again. So oh, yeah, wow. that's probably what so, happened there. So then in the time period that I've been here, um, it's gone down. So I think your hopes of a launch on Friday are getting a little stronger. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, indeed. That's, that's a quick turnaround. My goodness. It's also the fastest turnaround time for, for, for the pad, but we're not getting ahead of ourselves. We're probably going to mention that on the Starlink uh, um, live stream for, or, or Friday, if, if we actually get the launch on Friday. So, yeah. Cool. Something to look forward to. Just point it out. <laughs> Excellent. Hopefully my audio is okay. I just I just randomly... Moved some stuff around. Oh no, I'm hearing it sounds bad. Hang on, what if I what if I do this? There we go. I just tweaked it a little bit more. Live on air. Look at that. Sounds sounds better to me. All right, cool. Um, let's see. Candyman says thanks, Jack. Sounds great. One minute ago. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Candyman, for the support. And cultured, thank you for the support. They say I can't wait for the day. To see the zero G indicator to be a Starship plushie, uh, that would be pretty cool to see a Starship plushie be a zero G indicator. But we'll uh, we might have to wait a little bit for that. But thank you for the support, cultured. I think you guys would hear me scream and holler all the way from here if that happened. <laughs> I'd, I'd be yeah, hearing myself I'd... scream and holler too, because in my ever so humble opinion, that's a pretty cute plushie. Um, indeed it is. And we've only got a couple left, so if you want one of the Starship plushies, maybe go snag one right now. Let's see, we're getting some more questions here. Detroit Mission Control with a really good pre-launch question here asking, what is the best way to cook bacon? It's in the oven. All right, I'll, Wait, I'll, I'm done oven? with that. Uh -oh. Yeah, oven bacon. Yeah, in the oven, uh -oh. so you don't uh -oh. splatter yourself. But that's yeah. the best part of cooking bacon. You get to splatter yourself. I I wholeheartedly disagree. No, but then your clothes <laughs> smell like yummy bacon for the rest of the day. Like, 
that's the perfect solution. Um, I mean, okay, to each their own. <laughs> uh, let's see, but no, really, oven bacon's the best way to go. Anyways, let's go. Let's do some real questions. Now I need to eat bacon when I get done with this twenty-four hour thing that we're doing. Thanks. <laughs> I love um, our viewers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I we all. It's it's delicious. How can you not? Um, let's see. We talked about it a little bit, but we can go over it again as the crew is getting ready to uh, climb the tower there and walk walk across the access arm. Zach is asking which dragon capsule is being used this flight. It's Freedom, right? A new one. Yeah, this is the new one, Freedom. Yeah. I don't know too much about it besides it's the final one, right? I know it has USB ports. It is the final oh, yeah. dragon. Um, but there will be more cargo dragons produced. It is the final dragon, and it is named Freedom as a nod to Freedom 7. Oh, interesting. I yeah. like that. I like that a lot, too. So when we were talking about the Apollo vibes in the suit-up room, I mean, it's kind of a nice nod to the early space program. Yeah. We know that that there's at least another cargo dragon coming coming up. Because this one is so the previous one, Endurance from Crew 3, which is still at the ISS, that the, the serial number is C210. Oh, and we can see there the, the crew getting up. Oh, to wow. the yeah, I'll, I'll answer that later because I, I really like watching this. Uh, when they go into the elevator, look at those space That's super nice. The elevator. That's so cool. I think we've missed when they look up to the rocket. Ah. We might have, yeah. I want one of those FOD critical area signs for my kitchen. <laughs> yeah. So as I was saying, uh, the capsule for Crew 3, the serial number is C210, and this one is C212. So we know there's there's a, another capsule in the middle, so it's probably a, a cargo dragon that's going, mm. that's going up in the middle of that. Yeah. Let's see. Looking for some more questions. Although, hold on, I'm gonna I'm gonna finish that saying. Oh, we see them. We see them now at the at the level behind below the the one for the crew access arm. So yeah, the the booster for this mission, if it lands, which we hope it it does, uh, it's gonna fly on the CRS twenty five mission in June. Uh, currently looking oh, at June seventh, they said on the pre-launch conference, and that one is also gonna fly a, a cargo dragon. That's gonna be a cargo dragon, but it's gonna be a used cargo dragon, and it's gonna fly in its third uh, flight. I think it's C two hundred eight. I think it's the the serial number. So yeah, there's that. <laughs> a little bit of more information. Thank you for the more information. Inf in more information, good. Oh, whoa. Hold on. They're about to. There, there it is. is. There we go. There it is. <laughs> wow. Nice fist pump. I like it. <laughs> I mean, the excitement one must feel to look up at the vehicle that's going to carry them into space. It's just... I oh, can't yeah. even imagine. I'm loving all the pad ninjas there. I just I love the high visibility markings everywhere too. Like walk this way. It's it's just I don't know. The design of everything in typical SpaceX fashion is super slick and futury and I love it. Concur. Musical Wolves asking if NASA has tested meatless meat in space. I have no idea. <laughs> Sounds like something question. they test in space. Out of left field a little bit, but uh, yeah, there we go. Thanks for the question, Musical Wolves, and thanks but for wait, the support. Wait, wait, would they would they cook the meatless bacon on Mars in an oven or in a pan? Uh, solar oven. I don't solar know. Oven. I don't know why that, that makes, makes sense. sense, but yeah. It, it, and, yeah there we, it's... and there we have them on the phone. They're about to to make the traditional pre-launch call from the tower. I always wonder yep, wait, is... who they call to. You know. Or whether they that, do some prank calls. <laughs> that would be pretty great. Uh, I mean, it, we, I generally think of them calling family. Uh, but didn't Chris on the Inspiration4 mission call... Uh, 
I feel like he called the guy that gave him the ticket, or am I just completely making that up? I, I think I remember I that. I think he did, yeah. All right, yeah, I cool. remember that too. Uh, so yeah, it's not always necessarily family, depending on the astronaut, but definitely a chance to call someone important either way before you get on board the spacecraft. I mean, it's a very special moment that you are taking to sort of say whatever you need to say to whoever you need to say it to. It's, it's quite special. Um, Julia, do you want to do, do, is this the part where we talk about the phone and the whole, the whole story about saving the phone and all of that? Do you want to go into that? I sure could. And I, I wish I thought to pull up that picture and throw it in the control center, but, um, so that phone was uh, used during the space shuttle program. It has buttons that actually can be pushed while your uh, hands are gloved. So they're a little bit bigger. Uh, for those of us who are of age, think corded phone, much like we would have had um, in a phone booth, right? Uh, for those of you that have grown up with um, with cell phones, you're just going to have to Google this one. Uh, but it was a part of the space shuttle program and it was on the crew access arm at the end. And as we said, uh, astronauts make their call home or to friends or to whoever they want to say their goodbyes to and my I'll see you laters before they board their vehicle. Um, what happened was Elon was touring the pad with uh, some folks as they were getting ready to do the refurbishment and decide what was going to stay and what was going to go. And it, the phone got pointed to and they said, oh, that can go. And Elon said, oh, no, 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 that doesn't go. Um, we're going to save that. We're going to restore it, but still honor it and keep it a part of our tower as well. So there we are. Wow, that's so special. I just love... I love the fact that we kept uh, the the iconic traditional item. I, I asked this on uh, on the Axiom One launch. I'm going to ask it again. If anybody knows what model Bell telephone that telephone is, please let me know because I'm a Bell system nerd, um, and I assume it's a it's a Bell telephone of some type. And here we go. They're walking down the access arm. Ooh. First two. Yay. A split screen. Wow. 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 This is always fun to see. Hey, Chris is back. Hey. What's up, Chris? I'm back, yes, and apparently I'm told I sound good again. So apologies for sounding bad earlier. <laughs> I am the good luck charm. <laughs> it is. The, 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 the phone was just way too scared of Julia, so it just worked. <laughs> nice. So, Chris, I, I'm not sure how much you were able to hear. We are currently in phone calls, and the first two have walked across the access arm. Ah, yes. So that's what Julia was saying. If you grew up with a cell phone, you need to look this up. Yes. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Then that means they are right on the timeline. Seems like they're about, yeah. If not Gel slightly early. The, yeah. The Sharpie. <laughs> Sharpie is ready. What are they Sharpieing? Then, oh, that is ah. another one of the traditions, right? Yep. Yep. Signing the. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, signing signing their names on the NASA logo for NASA missions. Yep. See, one of the things, one of the other traditions that I like a little bit, because it's it's coming from from shuttle, but it's also a little bit. Um, I don't know. It, it connects to Colombia, uh, the tragedy. Um, you know, when they go into the vehicle and they're strapped in and everything, and they're about to do the the, the the seat rotations, they take out the patches from the ground crews and they keep it so that when they come back, they can return them to the to the ground crews. And that's sort of a tradition that's coming back from shuttle. And mm -hmm. for example, Doug Hurley was one of the ground crews for STS-107, the mm -hmm. like the tragic um, flight of Columbia, where. Uh, the crew was never able to give him back the his patch, and he got to to command the first Crew Dragon mission, and he went on with that tradition too. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's there's actually a picture of of the commander. Ah, uh, I don't remember now the the name. I'm sorry. Uh I, I usually know that um, 
yeah, the, the commander of, of STS-107, he's on the deck of, of Columbia while in orbit. And you can see in the background, there's Doc Hurley's patch uh, just right right behind him. And, like, that's a reminder, you know, that, that this is this is not an easy thing, you know, and there's always risks. And so that's one of the traditions that I actually like the most because sometimes, you know, these things are hard and those patches may never come back. You know, you got to take this seriously. So, yeah. For sure. And there we have Jessica and Samantha. Coming across the access arm, heading into oh, yeah, the dragon. Oh, yeah, extra. I okay. don't have any extra, Chris, sorry. Oh, sorry, I thought that was muted. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to Julia, sorry. <laughs> I have none extra. I don't know what you need, but I've got none extra. Um, <laughs> no worries. And we can see, there they are at the end of the arm, waiting to climb into Dragon. Which is, oh, you know, it's also just really in in, in some ways, you know, that you know, we t we talk about a lot about SpaceX's cadence, but but their cadence on crew flights is really something to to talk about here because I mean, this is the fourth, this is the fourth one for NASA that they're doing, but that also includes Demo Two, um, mm -hmm. and it includes Inspiration Four and Axiom One. Mm -hmm. um, and they launched their first crew flight in May of 2020, not even two years ago. And this is the cadence that they are at. So, I mean, that 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 is an equally important part of the SpaceX cadence conversation is not just their, you know, ability to throw Starlinks into orbit once a week um, or less, but how many people they are putting up into space. And it is worth noting, too, that while it ended up not breaking the record at the launch pad, um, uh, uh, that 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 basically this is the first time since October of 1985 that two crew missions launch in the same calendar month from the same launch pad in the United States. Um, you have to go back wow. to Atlantis and Challenger in October of 85, and they turned that pad around. Basically, Challenger was out on the pad for 12 days, um, wow. and 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 they lifted off. Um, so it doesn't quite. If my memory serves, it doesn't quite break the record um, between Axiom and Crew 4, but it is right there with what they were able to achieve in the shuttle program in the 80s with that flight rate. We've got our requisite shuttle reference out of the way. I guess we said shuttle when we talked about the phone earlier, too, so we're, <laughs> we're clear on shuttle references. Well, if there's one thing that Are NSF can do, <laughs> <laughs> I might have more later on. We'll see. But you see, uh, Samantha, so. but you see Samantha there uh, in the crew arm, uh, waiting for her turn to board as well, um, with Bob and Shell already inside. Excellent. Let's see here. Someone said uh, whether this was just an asset tradition. It's actually. It seems like it's just all SpaceX crews missions because Inspiration 4 and Axiom 1 also followed the same tradition of taking the patches from the ground crews. So yeah. Yeah, I think that's one of those things where regardless of of if it's a private mission, a government mission on a SpaceX, on a, you know, on a SpaceX Dragon, on a Boeing Starliner, on a NASA Orion, I think they're like like you're saying Alex, right? Like there are and, and Julia was saying too with the phone that got saved, you know, there are just certain traditions you don't let go of. Mm -hmm. I, one thing I don't like that I do wish they would let go of is the, the having the gloves like hang off their hands. Like I'm always like, Oh God, their wrist is broke. Okay. No, we're good. We're good. It's just, they don't have the glove on yet. It always weirds me out a little bit. I'm sorry. Alien, alien. <laughs> <laughs> human suit, human suit. Exactly. <laughs> Um, let's see here. Holy cow. Phil Gomez. Thank you so much, Phil. We've got a very, very generous $99 super chat from Phil Gomez. As we wow. watch the wall get signed, they say, thank you for the many hours of education and entertainment. Your enthusiasm is infectious. Well, that's about the kindest thing you could possibly say. 
uh, with with also a very kind amount of support for what we do. But for real, I mean, I, I don't think there's anything that, that we do here at NASA Space Flight that we could be more happy about hearing that we're successful in doing uh, than getting people excited about space flight. So and I'm glad you, the enthusiasm is infectious. And, and speaking of enthusiasm, did, did you see how many patches Samantha just ripped off all of the ninjas to take with her into mm-hmm. Dragon? That was impressive. <laughs> she just went around like, bang, 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 give. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> she knows the tradition. Yep. Oh, there we go. And there goes Jessica uh, on into Dragon. So she is the final of our four crew members to board. So they are all in. Uh, Shell, Bob, Samantha, and Jessica. All in their awesome. Dragon now. Excellent. Once again, thank you. extremely thankful for the support i know everyone else here is as well so thank you so so much phil a lot of cool stuff coming down the pipeline so just wait let's see moldy space thanks for the support they say no matter how you prepare for it the best way to cook bacon is to pepper it peppered bacon gang i did Ooh, not know yeah that was a thing bacon's good oh I'm you haven't good. had this jack you need to. no i'm slacking I uh let's see have a nasa space light sampling party yeah. i'm down <laughs> uh and Vatasiana, thank you for the support. They say thanks for the clarification. All nominal zero bonkies. Correct. We are at we are at zero point zero zero bonkies right now. And we like that. No bonkies. <laughs> uh <laughs> sometimes bonkies are good. Right now, bonkies are not good. Um and that is my allocation for that word for the stream. Uh no more of that. Let's see. Here's kind of a an older question from when they were in the Teslas, but I still find it interesting and it's relevant because right now they're sort of getting seated, getting their suits plugged into Dragon. Uh, William K is asking, what do they have to modify on the Teslas to accommodate the flight suits? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Yeah, so in, in general, just to accommodate the suit itself, nothing. Um, but to accommodate all of the stuff the suit needs to keep them comfortable and cool. So they did have to outfit the Teslas with air filtration systems. So there was big hoses that you saw, like when they were in the crew suit up room, you saw big hoses coming down that provides air. And, and I think it's, I think it's nitrogen, gaseous nitrogen is pumped through there to keep them cool and everything. Um, and comfortable so they did have to uh they did have to do some modifications there for those types of interfaces that are not necessarily the suit but all the things you need to keep the person in the suit comfortable when the suit is not in the dragon doing it so um, connected to the systems in dragon to keep them cool makes sense And uh, I think one one thing, if you if you're if you're joining a NASA space flight stream for the first time for crew, one thing that we really like to do is um, anytime they are talking over the comms net um, during really critical events, we do like to talk about that. And we are coming up to that period. So if we're in the middle of answering one of your questions and we stop talking all of a sudden, and then the comms net comes on, um, do know we will come back to your question. But we do not like to talk over some of those official communications between the crew and ground control as they're getting ready. Speaking of comm checks and official communications, uh, we're like an hour and a half or so into our stream so far, and while we wait for those uh, that audio to come through, of course we'll shut up immediately once we hear it come through, let's go around the horn and uh, reintroduce everybody that is on the stream in case people are freshly joining and they're wondering, who am I hearing talk or what's going on here? So I'm Jack Beyer, I'm a photographer, YouTube, lackey, all kinds of things for NASA Spaceflight, um, that's me. And of course, also joined by uh, Alex or Alejandro. I did. I said Alex. I'm sorry, Alex. Also joined by Alejandro tonight. Yeah, Alejandro, what's don't up? Worry. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about about Alex or Alejandro. Uh, I think I think Alex is is better for for English speakers. So yeah, if if you want to 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 call me Alex, that's okay. Yeah, I, I basically write stuff for NSF, and well, I'm doing now live stream commentary. Yeah. 
Oh, oh, let's stop right there because Al- uh, Alejandro doesn't just write stuff for us. He is like the uh, whereas like Jack t- t- talks that I am the walking encyclopedia of a of a space shuttle. Alex is the walking encyclopedia of Starship and Falcon Nine. So uh, yeah, Can't let's confirm. make sure to throw that out. Yeah, <laughs> definitely good good shout there. Um, also out there, you hearing just heard uh, the voice of Chris Gebhardt, who was giving us a cam review from Walkout and is now back at the launch site near julia so chris what's up uh well my spirits and my anticipation for a fantastic liftoff here today uh that's what's up for me why would your spirits be up there's only four people going to space today i know that's that's something you'll never hear me say a a very regular wednesday (laughs) (laughs) i almost believed uh the dismal uh tone of your voice for a second there (laughs) Yes, indeed. I tried. And we've also got Julia out in the field. We've been hearing her talk here and there as well. Julia, what's up? You know what's up? My beach chair is up. I got my feet kicked up. Chris has a chair. We're looking at a rocket and helicopters and the crew, and I couldn't be any happier. What more could you want, really? Cool. And also, we've got Nick... On comms, Nick, Mr. Nick and Sweeney, the one and only. What's up, Nick? Yo, yo, yo. Um, I, I'm not looking at a rocket right now, which makes me a little sad and slightly jealous there. But I'm looking at it on the screen, so that makes me feel. You slight. only, you only spent all day looking at rockets, though. So not yeah, too but bad. It's still not enough time, though. I mean, I I spent 14 hours looking at that rocket today, and I, I still haven't looked at it long enough. I need to go back out tomorrow and look at it some more. Pro tip, get it tattooed on the inside of your eyelid. That way, every time you blink, you'll see it. Wow. 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 No thanks. <laughs> you first. Uh, pass. Hard pass. <laughs> yeah. um, and, of, of course, in the background, we've got Michael Baylor pulling the levers, pushing the strings. Just imagine him in a large steampunk sort of themed room. Uh, there's like a water wheel. There's various steaming appliances and spinning whirly gigs. And it all yeah, makes the live stream hamsters. work. I've heard three hands. Yes. Yep. At least at least one gopher. Um, you know, various marmots and assorted reptiles and anyways, Michael in the background doing what he what we need to do to get the stream to work. So thanks, Michael. I see I see Patrick in there too. I think Patrick also helping out. So what's up, Patrick? Um Oh my what? We have another insane hundred dollar super chat from Gravelly Dawn. Gravelly Dawn. Oh my no god! Thank name. yeah, that's impressive. Wow, this is like the the point at which is I become speechless that folks are even doing this. Hundred dollars is a lot of money to me. Yeah. I know it's a lot of money to y'all too. It's yeah. like holy cow to to spend that on us. I mean, thank you so so much. And the best part is is the the text here is the the it's, the text is about I can't even talk straight. The text is about bacon. <laughs> Bacon good. Oh. There we go. I, I I got a sentence out. Um, they say the best bacon is bacon spam fried. I would, now, I've never even had spam, so this is another thing oh. I'm going to have to try, I suppose. You haven't oh. had spam? Oh, I haven't either. No. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Wait. But Chris, so bacon Chris, you're... spam. Bacon spam is my favorite spam, and I didn't even enjoy spam at all until I was an adult. So if you haven't tried spam, please go and appreciate that wartime specialty. And... um. I would say slice it up. Some people eat it raw. Ew. Okay, ew, gross. Ew, ew. Yeah, no, no, I can't. But um, but if you slice it up or cube it and fry that in a pan a little bit, serve that over a little bit of rice, you'd be surprised, y'all. It's great hurricane food. All right, well noted. American meat. Yummy, yummy. <laughs> <laughs> we don't think too much about hot dogs and spam, okay? Let's not discuss the what. <laughs> Is in it. <laughs> I'm I'm resisting the urge to say the word spam multiple times in a high shrill voice akin to Monty Python. So I just know that I I've gonna, hear it in your say. head. I won't do it. I won't do it to you. Just hear yeah. it in your head. <laughs> yeah. So one of the th- one of the actual funny things about this uh, is spam and being on a SpaceX live stream for Crew Dragon is that Crew Dragon, the white thing that you see outside. That's actually called SPAM, and it stands for SpaceX Proprietary Ablative Material. So it's basically like a thermal heat shield oh. that they have 
it's not the main one, but it's the one that it is around of the pressure vessel and protects like the, all the internal bits of the, the crew dragon. The white part that makes it a marshmallow, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's the wait, one. wait, you're you're telling me there are four astronauts sitting inside of spam right now? Yeah. Pretty much. I'll be yeah. protected <laughs> by spam. Yeah. Man. Wow. <laughs> The things I love you learn. It. I love I'm, it. I'm, I now think spam is going to be a part of every dragon live stream. I sure hope so. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Gravely Dawn, for an excuse to talk about spam and uh, for discussing bacon. Any Anyone that likes bacon is a friend of mine. Um, and But seriously, thank you so much for the support and for matching, uh, what was it, matching Phil's earlier insane super chat. We. Uh, Goes without saying that data to run all these live streams is not cheap. Everything we do is not cheap, and it's absolutely awesome that we get to do what we get to do. I, I feel extremely lucky. I know y'all really enjoy doing this stuff too. I can hear it in your voices um, because doing this is fun. Getting people excited about spaceflight is fun, and we can do that because of y'all's support. So thank you so. Oh my God, <laughs> Tim C. Tim C. Thank you. I, I mean, it's like. Uh, what am Another I even one. supposed to say? That is incredibly generous. Incredibly generous. Thank you so much, Tim C. Um, I mean, we're going to take that money and plow it right back into the field that is NASA Space Flight and grow all kinds of cool produce for you. So we Bam. just, know, so just know that... So say what? Go ahead. We're going to specifically grow spam with it because I'm pretty sure spam grows on trees. There we go. Done. Perfect. So I, I, I can't even... Stand by. Uh, comms checks that we should hear coming up. We are ready for contacts. SpaceX copies freedom. Stand by for umbilical comm checks. Standing by. And great timing. Sounds like comm checks are starting now. And you'll hear a couple acronyms. LD means launch director and MD means mission director during these comp checks. The other acronym you might hear is CORE, C-O-R-E, which stands for crew operations and resource engineer. Oh, what does SPAM stand for? Oh, hold on. Uh, SpaceX proprietary ablative material. No, it stands for spiced ham. Oh, come on, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was endlessly satisfying. We had comm checks from the commander and the pilot first. CDR, PLT, MS-1, MS-2. Comm check. Freedom, CDR. Loud and clear. Freedom, PLT, loud and clear. Freedom, MS-1, loud and clear. Freedom, MS-2, loud and clear. Core copy is loud and clear. Umbilical comm check is complete. Stand by for ground station comm check. Freedom, standing by. So that tone, that beep boop back and forth tone, is it called a quindar tone, and it signals a start and stop of a transmission. A little fun fact for you there. What does the what does that mean, quindar? I actually don't know what the word quindar itself means. I just know that that tone is a quindar tone. SpaceX, come check. SpaceX, freedom has you loud and clear. Core, loud and clear. Ground station comm check is complete. Stand by for TDRS comm check. Freedom, standing by. And TDRS stands for Tracking Data and Relay Satellite. TDRS is part of NASA's big space-based communications platform in geostationary orbit. Freedom, 
Freedom, SpaceX, ComCheck. SpaceX, Freedom, how's you loud and clear? Core, loud and clear. Keepers, ComCheck is complete. Stand by for ComChecks with MD and LD in the launch configuration. Dragon MD on countdown one, calm check. MD, Freedom has you loud and clear on countdown one. MD, loud and clear, stand by for calm check over Dragon to ground. Freedom MD on Dragon to ground, calm check. MD, Freedom has you loud and clear over Dragon to ground. Good to hear your voice this morning, Anna. Good to hear yours as well. MD loud and clear. Stand by for comm checks with LD. Freedom, LD on countdown one, comm check. LD, Freedom has you loud and clear on countdown one. Good morning, friends. Orange shell, LD loud and clear. Stand by for comm check over Dragon to Ground. Freedom, LD on Dragon to Ground, comm check. LD, Freedom has you loud and clear of the Dragon to Ground. LD, loud and clear. Freedom SpaceX, with that shell, launch configuration comm checks are now complete. Please report when ready for seat rotation per section 2 of 4.100. Freedom copies, welcome. All right, comm check complete. Woo-hoo. Now they're going to rotate the yep. seats once everyone says that they're ready. Yippee skippy. And then next step after that is get all the removed Space before... Freedom, we are ready for seat rotation for 2.2. Freedom, Space Freedom, Space Freedom, Space Freedom, Space Freedom. And then after seat rotation, it'll be get all of the removed before flight stuff out of the capsule and close the hatch. There's like a pad ninja standing there like, hey, this this bag, this trash bag labeled big bag of fod, um, do I take this or do I leave it in? I, I leave it in, right? And, and the four astronauts behind. are like, yeah, no, no. And then his boss behind him is like, yeah, I'm going to need you to come in and work on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> Um, let's see here. Paul Espinoza Rojas, thank you. For... Hang on. Who? Yeah. We had a little bit of a crash there. And and we're back? Yep. No worries. All right, so so uh Alejandro, let's let's do this again. How would you say this name? Uh, Paulina Espinoza Rojas. Oh, even the rolled R. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Official. Right. And Cynthia uh, Samis, thank you for becoming a Capcom member. A bunch of new members today, which is really awesome because, again, the vagaries of the YouTube algorithm mean that sometimes our views get a whole, or sometimes our videos get a whole bunch of views. Sometimes they don't get a whole bunch of views. And that variation can be pretty tricky when you're trying to plan things out long term and pay the bills. But the membership program is astounding for helping us to be able to sort of do all of those things, you know, make uh, make plans and do cool stuff and just pay the bills, pay the data bills, pay, you know, everyone for their time. So definitely super awesome that we uh, are getting some new members today. Thank you so much. Uh Let's see. Holy cow. We got Moldy Space Industries with a $50 super chat. Thank you, Moldy Space. They say, I'll throw in a match. I'll throw in half a match to the spam funds. I'd lo- People are doing like the match thing on our streams lately. It's really cool. Like, I can't even. Wow. Thank you so much. I just appreciate that we got the phrase uh, half match on the spam thing. <laughs> yeah, like, right. I like, uh, I like that. <laughs> Somebody post that to brand new sentence on Reddit. That's a great subreddit. Yeah. <laughs> I think at some point we're going to have to start journaling some of these things. Probably, yeah. We yeah. Uh, count down until bingo starts happening again. Um, oh, we, that could be a fun bingo ooh, card. Things heard on NSF. Yeah. 
Musical Wolves, thank you for the support. This is a 15-minute old one, so I'm not quite sure what they're referencing here. But they say, what are the orange backpacks? Are they parachutes at T23828? Mm. Uh, I have no idea. Okay, I can scroll back and try to answer that question. All right, that's your homework. I'm going to put it back in the queue, and when you know it, yell at me, and I'll bring it back up. Oh, so when, now when, I see them. Now I see yeah. them. Uh, they are on the on the white room at the end of the crew access arm. I think those are probably protection suits that they have for when they... Yeah, it, it, it says crew, crew E-L... CAs. I don't have any idea what that acronym means, but they are probably some kind of protection suits in case they have to um, escape the the crew access arm. So yeah, that's probably it. That's total wild guess, but it's probably a, a good one, I think. Just yeah, emergency use of it. Yeah, emergency equipment or things they might need if you know. This is sort of like you got to be prepared for anything when you're on that crew arm because you can't just walk down to walmart <laughs> you know yeah. when, when you need it but uh, in terms of the parachute question in particular um so space shuttle crews used to wear parachutes as part with their launch a uh, launch and entry suits because that bailout was one of the potential options to save the crew if something went wrong during a shuttle launch but the dragons do not have that um you would come down on the dragon capsule yourself there is no getting out of it to parachute down to safety so so the crew does not wear parachutes um anymore for launching on dragons hmm some more super chats really quick so we don't get too far behind i definitely want to be sure that everyone knows that we support the super chats just the same as we uh we appreciate the support from our members and it's just Again, we can't do this stuff without y'all support. So whether that's just watching the stream and enduring the ads or whether that's hitting the like button and subscribing or telling your friends about what we do, uh, it's super, super duper extra appreciated. You don't have to be pumping a, a absolutely insane in a good way, $100 super chat into the stream for us to appreciate it. Whether it's $1, whether it's 50 cents, whatever you got, we super, super, super appreciate the support so we can keep doing this awesome stuff. I mean, if you would ask me a year ago, even just one year ago, if uh, the cadence in 2022, what it would be like, I don't think in my wildest dreams it would be this active. So we are all, needless to say, extremely busy. Uh, and your all support enables us to stay that level of busy and keep doing really cool stuff. Chris, how many times have you driven to KSC this week? <laughs> in the last like seven days uh, oh dear god um enough, <laughs> that I, enough that i ended up getting a hotel room for the last two nights <laughs> oh that actually and I, uh, I, and I live an uh, hour away so let that be the answer for how many times no I've that's yeah. wow. that's really good don't don't mess around with driving sleepy you know that's that's a big thing in the film industry where that's people exhausted thing, yeah. after being on set all day you know it's not not good to drive sleepy in the same in this very similar way uh, to you know driving drunk or what have you. It's you don't want to drive impaired. So I'm glad that you were able to to get a exactly. hotel room. I mean, it's it's very easy for the human brain to be like, well, it's only an hour away, but it's like mm, fatigue. And, it's real. And you can still be riding that adrenaline wave after a launch, and then you get halfway home and, and you crash, it's crashing, and you yeah, so. Uh, but but yeah, all, all told, I mean, between all of these events and some other things that we're working on and SLS, uh, I think I've been here every single day the last seven days. Yeah, I'm I'm glad I asked you that then oh. because that's thank you for doing that, Chris. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my pleasure. I mean, my God, like I was totally the kid growing up here in Central Florida who, like, my parents had to drag me to Disney World twice because when they asked me where I wanted to go, I said the Kennedy Space Center. So, um, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Joel, thank you for the support. They say, nice, God jo nice job, guys. Love the commitment to your craft. That's awful kind of you to say, Joel, and thanks for the support. Mr. Gwig, thank you for the support. Is that like a Star Trek character from a series I haven't watched yet? Mr. Gwig is saying, uh, always watching your videos, and we learn a lot. The, the work you are doing is amazing. Thumbs up to everyone working hard for NSF. Let's go for 1 million subs. That's going to be a fun milestone. I'll, I mean, I'll just be happy if we get our 100,000 sub 
like plaque or whatever. We still haven't even gotten that one yet, and we've crossed five hundred thousand. So, but a million subs—that's that's going to be a fun milestone to look forward to. Maybe around the time of the first orbital flight or something like that, we'll start cr- getting up there. But thank you for the I support hope the there. First orbital flight for Starship isn't that far away. <laughs> that's fair. Yeah, very fair. Well, Hopefully not. Or we grow that quickly. Let's hope that. Let's go for yeah, the positive go. spin on that. Yes. Let's do that oh, one. <laughs> the, the glass being half full. I love it. Vatsiana, thank you for the support. They say, sorry, I can't join the $100 train this time. It'll become an unsustainable addiction, but you guys are worth every penny that comes your way. Thank you so much. We, it's appreciated. So it's a, I can't even talk. Thank you. It's really appreciated. Can I say um, something about this? Because I, um, I, I mean, feel, yeah, go for it. It's, I feel it's important to, to, to note here that even if you cannot support us uh, with money, like, any like, any subscribe that you do, like that's important to us too, you know, that help us grow. And that's always support. Uh, even if it's not with money, it's always helping us uh, being able to grow and reach more people, which is what we actually want, reach more people and, and get them excited about the space flight. I really like that, yeah. So yeah, yep. don't, don't worry if you cannot do $100, that's okay. Like if you if you cannot even do any dollar at all but can do just you know subscribe like share and everything all the usual stuff that people say on youtube you know but but really it does it does help us grow and and be able to reach more more people so yeah you know what thank you alejandro for saying that and i just want to also add to that that if y'all weren't there asking questions imagine how much a four or five hour live stream might be a little bit painful. So thank you. Thank you for your curiosity and asking the questions and sometimes challenging us to learn new things ourselves. Sure enough. That, yeah, that, very, very well question, put. Yeah, the questions you all ask, what Julia just said, really do push us. Yeah. So thank oh, you. Oh, I've got a good one. I've got a good one then. Um, I was, it's here. It's been sitting here <laughs> nestled in the queue for right. a, good num- a good number of minutes. So be ready. Get Brace yourselves. But real, real quick... Uh, Joel Schick, thank you. Or yeah, Joel Schick, thank you so much for the new membership at Pad Rat member level, and Peter Casita at Pad Rat member level. Very awesome of both of you. And Paulina Espinosa Rojas, I'm not good at rolling my R's. I apologize. Thanks for the support, the additional support there. I'm just I'm just doing my best, Alejandro. And no uh, of course, Westy the Third, thank you for the support. They say morning. What a better way to start the day than a launch with NSF. Get yourselves a coffee on me. All right, I think I'm go for coffee load. All right, and you can see the hatch is getting closed here. And then they'll do some leak checks, right, Chris? That is correct. Yeah, hatch will be closed, and then the next step will be leak checks. And just like as an FYI on this one, this is this is uh, the leak check one is um, a step that we have seen both on the Crew-1 mission and the Axiom-1 mission that ended up needing to be redone because it, um, it wasn't a good and proper seal the first time around. So if that should happen again today, that is not a, like, oh, no, something's majorly wrong. They can't make the window. That's not, that, that's not a huge concern if they have to redo the hatch. They sort of build in enough buffer time in the schedule to be able to accommodate having to do that. A couple of times. Indeed. Yeah, I'm looking at the schedules right now, and I think they are about 25 minutes ahead of the schedule. So, look, if, if they have to, to redo this, I think they probably have enough time. So, yeah, not exactly. a big deal, at least for now, you know. Let's hope. Good stuff. Yeah. Um. Okay, let's see here. Noel SP is asking, how are the different modules of the ISS controlled? Is there one central computer monitoring and controlling everything? I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to instead waffle and say, Chris, Alex, Nick, who wants to take this one? Julia? The answer is that there is a central control element to the International Space Station, um, but both, but on both the U.S. and the Russian side. Um, so if there were ever an issue with the Russian side, the U.S. side could control issues with the U.S. side, Russian side could control. We actually saw this play out when the systems started fighting each other um, back in July or August when the Naoka module got there and had its weird thruster malfunction. And the Russian side and the U.S. side started fighting each other for control of the station. 
and basically they 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 relinquished U.S. control and gave it all to Russia to figure out how to stabilize everything in that regard. But um, there are two different um, sort of central control areas, but each individual module has its own computer systems and its own monitoring systems, but not like it's not like you could detach the European Columbus module and it becomes a free flying module and it can support itself and come back. The modules are sort of integrated together where not all of them have full life support systems because of how you can move air around and, and stuff like that. But in general, that's sort of how it operates on the ISS. Awesome. Detroit Mission Control says, thanks to the entire team for your hard work and coverage okay, tonight. Cool. Do we have any updates on the new SpaceX space suits? I'm guessing they're talking about the EVA suits? Ah, yes. Um, we do not have any information, any new information on that. Um, we should expect some more information about the Polaris Dawn mission to be coming up here rather, re relatively soon. Uh, some of the SpaceX people who are on that flight as astronauts were still involved in training the Axiom 1 and Crew 4 crews. Um, so we should hear a lot more um, from the Polaris Dawn program and SpaceX overall um, as uh, once we are past Crew 4, because theoretically it might be the next crew launch depending on where Crew 5 ends up later this year. I think they were saying September for Crew 5, I think. So perhaps the next one after that. Yeah, and, and I think one of the interesting things on that one, and, and one that we should definitely like like briefly touch upon here, is you know exactly when that mission will launch is a little bit up in the air. Um, one, because... Um, uh, j just one, because this one has not launched yet, and this is the one that they will be going up to replace. And they're also going to want to look at, okay, when did we actually launch? When do we want to get Crew 5 up there? Do we want Crew 4 to have a full six months? Do we want Crew 4 to have a little less time up there to get 5 up there sooner? Uh, you know, how is this all working with the ISS visiting schedule? So September might be the target, but don't be overly surprised if that winds up in October. Mm, indeed, yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Daphne is asking, what is the coolest or best jellyfish effect that we have seen? I bet I know your answer, Chris and Julia, but I will ask you guys. I'll just go first. Uh, did you say me go first? Yeah, you go first. Me go first. Okay, I go first. It's cool. I can do that. Um, the most impressive jellyfish I think I actually saw was, was not the one I think you're going to say, Jack. It was a Starlink flight because the moon lit up the second stage contrail not the sun nice um yeah so it was like a midnight-ish mission or something like that of, of a starlink a few years ago and all of a sudden it started to kind of it did a, a different kind of jellyfish where it was actually purple instead of white um but i think i remember it, the pictures from that one yeah yes but it was it was shocking and just absolutely wonderful to see that so that's my favorite nice Julia? Um, I think, I think it was crew two. Um, I think. Oh, oh yes. Where, where you saw the cold gas thrusters firing after stage separation. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. Was I was, in, yes. I was in Titusville for that one because COVID and you were on base, I believe, and, or on site. And I was, oh, wow, everybody that was around me, ooh, whoa, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was a good one. Nice. And I'm not being mean, Alex and Nick. I'm pretty sure, though, uh, y'all haven't had the chance to see it yet, right? Well, I, I saw it uh, on the Inspiration 4 flight on my live stream, but no, I did not get to see it in person. Yeah. Yeah, I thought, everyone was, I thought everyone's answer was going to be I-4, because that was a good one. Oh wait, that that it I was. will vouch for them. That was an excellent one too. Uh, you know, like Chris said, they're rare, so each one actually is cool, and it's hard to pick which one is cooler. Yeah, each one kind of has its yeah. own personality and is different based on, I mean, I'm sure many different variables: exact launch time, what the moon is doing, what the upper level winds are doing, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think for me, the coolest one that I have seen so far is. 
uh salcom i forget which salcom it was i want to say it was 1a oh. uh i was on my traditional top of a mountain spot like 40 miles south of the pad and so rather than the rocket sort of going away from me and uh doing its light show thing it kind of went right past me and did the light show thing and that was really really nifty um the coolest one I haven't gotten to see, there's like a, in 2017 or 2015, I forget, there was a Trident missile test that happened to be launched um, in the vicinity of Los Angeles, and it was visible, uh, you know, same kind of twilight effect, except you could see the multiple independent reentry vehicle sort of spinning around and flinging off warheads and decoys, which oh, I'm so mad I didn't get to see that, but that probably would have taken the cake if I had seen that, just because when are you ever going to see that again? Um yeah. But good question there from Stephanie. Can can one of you describe real quick what that jellyfish effect is caused by? I, I think I know, but but perhaps other people don't. Oh yeah, good point. It is um yeah, so it is primarily caused when um there is a lighting difference between the ground and where the rocket is ascending into. Um, and it's usually on the East Coast, it is primarily a morning event where the rockets are lifting off about forty to thirty minutes prior to sunrise. So just starting to get light out, but the sun has not actually come across the horizon at the launch site. And then the exact reverse in Vandenberg, it is primarily an evening thing because it involves being, it involves the rocket basic, the rocket plume basically being backlit by the sun and refract and all the, um, all the liquid elements in the exhaust refracting the light in the upper atmosphere. And that's one of the reasons why it was so surprising to see it on Inspiration4, because they launched shortly after sunset here from Kennedy, and no one was really expecting it to do, we call it, do the thing. Um, that's what we call it, um, basically, for the jellyfish. But but that's what it, that's usually what it is. Yeah, I think it can happen on both coasts in at both sunrise and sunset, but sometimes it's, like, better on one or the other. I'm not quite sure, but I've definitely seen... A similar effect down here at sunrise. Um, cool stuff. Thick, thank you for becoming a Capcom member. Roseanne asking us to post about membership options. I think that's going on in chat right now. Thank you so much, Roseanne, for yeah, the support. Be, oh, and Roseanne became a Capcom member. member. Yeah. Awesome. So, Roseanne, you'll get Discord access with that. Uh, Discord is awesome. So, pop into there and check it out when you get a chance. As we wait for the hatch on the dragon capsule to get closed. Looks like they're doing some work. Is that tape? Are they taping things? What's going on? Well, I sure hope they don't tape that together because, you know, space. Eh, yeah, speed tape. Well, if, if, if it's flex steel, it's fine. But if it's just regular tape, that's probably not a good idea. I think if it's gaff tape, we're good. If it's duct tape, questionable. Speed tape, we're good. Uh, that cool reflective, like alumina, aluminized tape. I think we're good. Gotcha. So, uh, we're probably good. Yeah, we're probably good. Okay, good, good. Yeah, yeah. As long as it's not like masking. Yeah. Um, that doesn't do anything. Let's see. There's Roseanne on screen. Thank you so much again for becoming a Capcom member. Uh, and insane cable guy. Now I'm gonna have to watch that movie. Uh. -uh. Says maple syrup, brown sugar, marinated bacon on wood smoker, best ever. Thank you for the support there and for the bacon chatter as we wait for this door to close. All right, more questions. How about? Don't forget, everyone, you can ask questions at NASA Space Flight. We'll answer your questions if they're good, and also maybe if they're bad. I'm just yeah. kidding. There's no, there's no bad questions except for what are the four towers? That's a bad question. <laughs> Uh, oh, I forgot. I, I Wikipedia'd this, and I meant to say it, but we got distracted by bacon things. Shake the Grave Records. Thank you for, for uh, putting this out there. They say Qu Quindar or Kindar Tones were named for the manufacturer of Quindar Electronics, now QEI. So there's your answer to that question uh. from a little while ago. Nick. Uh. Uh, yeah, so that was the name of the manufacturer. Neat. Um, let's see. John is asking, is there an updated OFT2 Starliner? Uh, are there any updates on that? When launch, how long it will stay at the ISS, etc. Um, it is currently, uh, yeah, so we do have some information on that. Uh, they are currently stacking the Atlas V rocket right now in its vertical integration facility out at Slick 41. 
Um, so integration of the launch vehicle is underway. The launch date itself was actually just advanced by one day from uh, uh, to Thursday, May 19th at 1854 local or 2254 UTC on Thursday, May 19th. So that is Starliner's current launch target for the OFT2 mission. Um, Starliner itself has not emerged from the C3PF, the commercial crew and cargo processing facility. Um, uh, yet here at the Kennedy Space Center, that is where its hangar uh, is. Uh, but we are we would be expecting that about two and a half to two weeks prior to the planned liftoff would be the approximate role of Starliner to the pad. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Anytime. Uh, John is asking, could Dragon reboost the ISS? Simply a software upgrade or would new hardware be required given the thruster layout? I believe that's the case. What's, what's the deal with Dragon reboosting ISS? Technically possible. Um, although the thruster placements would cause some degree of issue with impingement onto the ISS structures. Um, that are immediately around it, um, but theoretically possible, although Dragon is not the most optimal vehicle to do it, the actual uh, U.S. vehicle that is optimal to do it and certified to do it is the Cygnus spacecraft from Northrop Grumman. Uh, and it is there is a Cygnus already there at the ISS, and it is actually planned to do a reboost maneuver of the ISS here before it completes its mission. Oh, cool. I don't know what it is about Cygnus. I, I just really like it. I think it's a cool Freedom space Freedom SpaceX, stand by for transition to pad hatch closed. From this point forward, please ensure that all items are secure from now through launch. That was a cool call out. It's, it's, that, it, is that is a cool call. call out. And it's like Sounds they like knew the... we, we weren't talking about the rocket in question, so they reminded us. <laughs> Sounds like yeah. the captain making sure your seatbelts are buckled for departure. Yeah, right? Yeah. That's the SpaceX version of make sure your tray table's yeah. up and your seat back is in its fully upright position. <laughs> or we will come and hassle you. Yeah. It seems like they, they took some time. We we talk about that, you know, they, they had a little bit of scheduled margins. It, it seems like they, they probably took that margin to uh, to look into the seals of the hatch and inside the capsule and make sure that everything was okay for for crew hatch um closure so yeah uh that was that was interesting seeing them work out uh on on all the, the seals the inside the capsule you could see one of the pad ninjas uh, crawl <laughs> below the the seats and everything yeah i do wonder uh you know, we've recently seen, I forget who it was that said that they incrementally improve the Dragon fleet as they go. We talked earlier about how Freedom uh, is the first Dragon to have like a USB port for each seat so that you can charge your devices, I assume is what that's for, um, which is hilarious, and but also makes perfect sense. Uh, I wonder if going forward, they'll try and do some tweaks to that door seal to make it less of a fussy thing. Because we kind of we kind of see them messing with that door seal every time. It feels like, right? Well, if if I was flying on Crew Dragon, I'd I'd, I'd want to make sure that the the seal is right. I feel like that's a that's a fairly important process. And and you think people are stepping over that and moving around it because it's you know just sitting right there. So. I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure there could be FOD, too, from, like, boots or what have you. But, yeah, that's exactly. a good point. It's a critical seal, so it makes sense they're going to take time and, and make sure it's just right. I just wonder. I wonder if there's anything they can do going forward to uh, to improve the time well, it takes knowing, to get it sealed. Knowing Elon, they'll just delete the seal and say, best part's no part. Mm. Here's, an oxygen, here's an oxygen mask. There we it's go. It's like the, the Martian vibes where there's just, like, no actual pressure vessel. It's just like all open. It's like the best seal is no seal. The best eclis is no eclis. Exactly. Um, let's see. Good question from John there. About reboosting the ISS. How we were talking about Cygnus for a second there. How many more Cyg Cygnuses? Cyg Cygni? How many more <laughs> of those are there? <laughs> I have made okay. So one, I have made that exact joke to Northrop Grumman, and I don't actually know what the answer is because they've never said the plural firm when I've made the joke. Um, but um, there are 
several more flights of Cygnus left under the extended CRS-2 contract. So um, Northrop Grumman did get an extension on the missions that they had under the, uh, under the Commercial Resupply Services 2 contracts. Um, so they have two more that will launch on Antares vehicles because they have enough of, they, they have two complete Antares ready for the NG-18 and 19 missions. After that, once we get to 2021 and 22, um, on those, they are going to have to look for a different launch vehicle. Um, and they will have that information later this year per a teleconference that they did with media earlier this month. Um, so that's sort of what's going on with Cygnus. But Cygnus is not going anywhere just because Antares has issues because it's partly a Russian-made rocket. Um, so no bueno there anymore. Um for launching on it but cygnus will in all likelihood it'll either end up on a falcon or a vulcan so stay tuned (laughs) all right multiple more cygni two more antari yes indeed uh and one one final thing about the cygnus is um they are they were actually built from the very beginning to be launch vehicle agnostic so it is not that much of a challenge for them to switch launch vehicles. And in fact, two Cygnus missions have launched on Atlas V rockets uh, when Antares had, once when Antares had a problem um, and blew up shortly after liftoff, um, they switched the next mission to an Atlas and launched from Florida. And then when they needed a little bit extra cargo capacity on one Cyg- uh, early Cygnus flight that Antares couldn't do, they launched on the Atlas on that flight as well. Got it. 12, 1224 Chris NG in chat says, it's Cygnopodes. <laughs> I love it. I like, like that. <laughs> um, Let's see. Bum, bum, bum. Looking for some more questions. Smooth Juice, thanks for the support. They say, here's some for the Bacon Fund question. What got you all interested in space? I don't... That's a tough answer for oh. me because I... I definitely, uh, I feel like space is one of those things as a kid that you can get interested in, right? Like, yeah, you know, some some kids are really into like archaeology, or some kids are really into, uh, I don't know. Now I'm blanking on, on other things. Like, yeah, yeah. trains. I I actually still love trains. Yeah. Um, so it's tough for me to say. Here we go. The, the hatch is closing. Woohoo! Uh, as we, as we watch the hatch close, um, yeah, my answer to this is my parents, um, for two very different reasons. Uh, my mom was a Star Trek science fiction fan. She grew up watching the original series when it aired, um, for the first time in the sixties. Um, the short version of the story is when she was pregnant with me, she had to be on bed rest for the last three months of the pregnancy. They were re-airing old episodes of next of the original series and next generation was just starting its first season at that time. She used to joke that if I didn't, quote, come out humming the theme song, something would be wrong. Um, But I kind of did. And I've been a Star Trek fan basically from in utero um, because Star Trek was always the show that I was allowed to watch as a young kid. It didn't matter what the episode was about. And the basic agreement that I had with my mom was that I could watch whatever Star Trek episode I wanted. And if I had questions about the content, I should ask her. Um, So I grew up. I like literally from birth with Star Trek um, on from my mom and my dad. Um, uh, the short version of that story is he grew up in Virginia. His parents moved to Florida after when he went, when he went to college his freshman year. And when he was driving down to Miami for the summer, um, it was May of 1969. The flight hatch now closed. We're going to be commencing health checks for the launch escape system. Expect moments, momentary flight computer state change followed by transition back to pad hatch closed. Freedom copies. Uh, And he was here in Titusville when Apollo 10 lifted off for the all but land dress rehearsal on the moon. And he made it a point to see every single crew launch from the U.S. from that day forward. And he did. He saw all of them until the day that he died. And when I was born, um, it took nearly 10 months for there to be a human launch because I was born between Challenger and Return to Flight with Discovery. And uh, I had a photograph that I lost very sadly in a move after both of my parents passed. Um, 
but I had a photograph for the longest time that was my dad holding me in his arms. I'm just shy of 10 months old. And across the river is Discovery launching on return to flight in 1988. So that is how I became a fan of the space program. That's amazing. Uh, At least you'll always have that photo in your mind. Yes. Yes. Always shall. Um, Alejandro, what got you interested in space as we watched the hatch closed and leak checks go uh, go, uh, on? Oh, boy. (laughs) I think the explanation is too long for that, but basically the ISS. I just, it it was like such a big endeavor uh, to, to be able to put together all of that kind of engineering marvel. So yeah, I, I just fell in love with that. And and from there, I just went with Shuttle. Uh, way back then, it was also Constellation too, <laughs> uh, with the Ares and, and everything. And then, you know, you, you just look up all the rockets and spacecraft that go to the ISS. And I found out the Dragon spacecraft from SpaceX. And it was like just a natural move to to be like, oh, hey, they're doing cool stuff. So yeah, that, that's what got me into this. Julia? Well, now I'm kind of feeling my age a little bit with Chris next to me, but um, (laughs) so Haley's comment, uh, one, uh, I do remember that. And um, I wanted to be an astronaut. I know. Aren't I ever though? And I actually still have a newspaper from that, um, that my mom saved for me. And so I wanted to be an astronaut and um, Challenger was kind of the defining moment for me. Um, If I couldn't be an astronaut, then I wanted to be a National Geographic photographer. So, uh, true story, Um, I end up moving to Florida after my husband passes. SpaceX was something kind of in the back of my mind. I remember talking about it. I remember talking about how, you know, we might be retiring the space station and what in the world are we going to do with that? And we haven't gone up for so long from our own soil. And so it was a conversation in the back of my head when we moved here. And uh, the very first day that my daughter and I landed in Titusville, Florida, um, there was a night launch. And that is all she wrote. Uh, That was an Atlas launch. And then the next one was the very first time that SpaceX actually landed a booster. um, And I got to watch it launch from here. And um, y'all, then I discovered these things come back to this port near us and I immersed myself in, that was my thing. Um, That's kind of how I learned all of this was uh, watching boosters come back to port and I was intrigued with how in the world it happens because SpaceX doesn't talk about that. Um, And somewhere along the way, I also found that little museum back um, by the viewing stands at 401 in the Launch and Landing Control Center for SpaceX and I became a volunteer for the now Space Force telling the history of space and I learned pretty quick. I didn't know a lot of it Freedom before SpaceX Apollo. For posting risk briefing. And um and I I know a lot more now. Hi Freedom. Okay, Chell. Today continues to look like a great day to fly. Uh, we're not tracking any issues for Dragon, Falcon or the ground systems. As well, there are no deltas to the pre-briefed emergency deorbit sites or triage site two. I'll copy. And freedom copies all. Those are uh, great words. All right, and then with that, uh, please prepare for Falcon 9 operator com checks. Awesome. No deltas, no issues. And it really does look like a great day to fly, if you ask me. It does. So, yeah, Those are the there's great my words. story in a nutshell. I didn't become an astronaut. I'm not a National Geographic photographer, but look Freedom. at this. I'm GNC telling the history. On. Com check. GNC Freedom has you loud and clear on countdown one. GNC loud and clear. Stand by for com check by the propulsion engineer. Dragon prop on countdown one. Com check. Prop Freedom has you loud and clear on countdown one. And Freedom, we have you loud and clear. Just have some fun today. Stand by for com check with a avionics engineer. Dragon, I love that. Avionics have fun today. One. Com check. Avionics, Freedom has you loud and clear on countdown one. Avionics has you loud and clear. Stand by for a com check by the ground segment engineer. Freedom, ground segment on countdown one. Com check. 
Ground segment, Freedom has you loud and clear. Ground segment, I have you loud and clear. Stand by for comm check with launch control. Dragon, launch control on countdown one, comm check. Launch control, Freedom has you loud and clear on countdown one. Launch control, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by the chief engineer. Dragon, CE on countdown one, comm check. CE, Freedom has you loud and clear on countdown one. CE, loud and clear. This completes the Falcon 9 responsible engineer comm checks. All right, comm checks complete. Excellent. No issues, no deltas, no changes to the emergency landing sites. Uh, Nick, what was your, (laughs) right? Nick, how, what was your, uh, the thing that got you interested in space? Ah, well, um, well, my dad was a, uh, uh, still is, uh, an engineer for an aerospace company and, uh, on the West coast to grow up around Vandenberg and, you know, saw a couple launches growing up. Um, but it was kind of always just something my, my dad did and, it wasn't something I was super excited about growing up. Uh, but I do distinctly remember the day that the uh, last shuttle flight flew and landed. And I, I was just like, huh, so are we just like done with space? Like, did, is it just over? And a little bit later, I found out about the Soyuz program. And I was like, oh, OK, so we're still going to space. But I guess the shuttle's not the thing anymore. Um, and then I went to school for accounting and didn't think much about space at all. Um, until uh, the Falcon Heavy launch. And I I guess a little bit before the Falcon Heavy launch, I'd heard about this random company from California that was like landing rockets in the ocean or something like really weird or whatever. Didn't really know much about that. Um, And then, uh, and then, yeah, the Falcon Heavy launch happened and, uh, and I did tune in live for that. And it just kind of blew my whole mind. Like (laughs) Elon always talks about the, uh, goal of SpaceX was originally to uh, put a small uh, uh, greenhouse on Mars and inspire people, but he, he definitely inspired me just with the uh, with the Falcon Heavy launch, because my goodness, that was something to behold. And yep, I tripped deep down into the rabbit hole of space, and uh, here we are at, uh, at what, one fifteen in the morning, 2.15 in the morning Eastern, uh, talking about rockets and watching people leave planet Earth. An hour and 41 minutes to go. Yeah, it's it's really nice that we had this sort of resurgence. I remember being a kid and being so obsessed with the shuttle and with space in general. And then uh, around like middle school or high school for me, it was like nothing's happening anymore. Shuttle done. Um, and then it all started picking back up again. So I'm just glad there's something to pay attention to. Uh, yeah, let's see. Good question there from Smooth Juice. Always always like to take a a good uh, like get to know us sort of question here and there. Um, okay, let's do some more meat and potatoes questions, really technical stuff. How about? Obi-Wan like Kenobi's that. asking, what are the parameters of Falcon 9 returning to the launch site compared to landing on a drone ship? Is it all about mass? What's going on there? Maybe Alejandro, let's, what, what do you, what do you want to tell us here? Oh, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> uh, Talking while yeah, muted. I th- yeah, that's that's typical. Uh, I think they're probably referring to what's the ma- the payload mass, uh, like constraints for when they have to return back to the to the launch site, or or when they have to do drone ship landings. So it also depends from each launch site. Like they have Florida, they also have Vandenberg, and then it also depends on the trajectory. For example, if they're doing some kind of dog leg maneuver. Or for example, from from Florida, if they're doing the don't say it, don't say it, I'm saying it, I said it, I said it, I said it, (laughs) (laughs) it's out there. (laughs) If they're doing the the polar launch corridor, (laughs) that's great. (laughs) If they're doing that, uh, it it it, it's not like they they cannot carry as much payload because of the huge dog leg. It's actually, I, I think it's sort of around seven to eight tons. To that pole or orbit for return to launch to launch site, that's sort of the maximum. Whereas, for example, for ISS trajectories, it tends to be about eleven to twelve tons, uh, the the maximum perfor- uh, payload. 
with with return to long side. Yeah. Um, and when we start talking about those high energy geostationary transfer orbit missions, those yeah. are all almost always drone ship landings because of indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They they have I think it was five point five tons for drone ship recovery, and then like that was the the maximum. But Freedom, SpaceX, good side hatch leak check. Yay! Woo! Freedom, That's copy. great. Thanks. All right, that's what we want to hear. Yeah. So as I was saying, uh, for GTO missions, it depends on the inclination that they target for and the apogee. So they can, they sometimes, if they have enough performance, they can basically shoot the the satellite way higher so that it doesn't need as much delta V to go into into the final geostationary orbit. So it also depends a little bit on, on that front. And they can launch, for example, they have launched seven ton payloads into GTO uh, with drone ship landings, but they have been with very low apogees. And so it's not like the traditional, they, they have a, a sort of like a nomenclature or, or sort of um, a reference uh, GTO uh, orbit. And then they, they cross reference every other uh, from that one, which is GTO 1800. And that means the the spacecraft will, will need 1800 meters per second left uh, to be able to go into the final ge geostationary orbit, which is about three, uh, 36,000 kilo kilometers and zero degrees in inclination. So, yeah. Got it. Well, how, how much is uh, the Crew Dragon capsule weigh uh, with the crew on board? I think it is about 13 tons. So it needs the drone ship landing because of that. Because, like, the, the RTLS maximum performance seems to be like like this these are just rough numbers okay so yeah, don't yeah. get it like r really down to the dot it's it's about 12 tons and this is like mm, a little bit heavier than that so i guess that's why and and also they probably get a little bit more margins on the second stage in case of underperformance of of sorts you know that that always pl uh uh plays a, a huge role into the safety of the crew, you know, if, if there's some kind of underperformance on the upper stage or something like that, that's always good to have that extra margins. And there's actually one other thing for the for the crew missions uh, that, that differ from the cargo flights in, in uh, of the Dragon V2s. Um, the trajectory that a crew mission has to fly is different than the trajectory that a cargo dragon would take to the same initial 200 kilometer parking orbit. Um, and that is because, mm -hmm. and that is, and that is because, hang on, and that is because they have to account for the tra trajectory of the capsule coming back into the atmosphere, um, for crew survivability in terms of G forces when, when they are coming back down. So they do fly a slightly different trajectory, um, not really noticeable. It is to the big, it is to the naked eye yeah. when you're standing here, but it's 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 more in the first stage early flight performance of the vehicle that it sl flies a slightly different trajectory. When it yeah, has I was about to, to say because I think that was that was more of a problem for Atlas V where it flies very oh, yes. lofted <laughs> and they need the two engines on the Centaur for that. Yeah, it's yeah. a huge problem with Starliner, um, but it is it is interesting from a visual standpoint. The Crew Falcon Nines do not look like they pitch as quickly as like a Starlink going off 39A to the same general inclination and a cargo flight. Like there are moments in crew flights where I'm like, you're going to start pitching, right? And then, and then you kind of see it start to arc a little bit downrange on, on a more normal trajectory. If <laughs> Kerbal has told me anything, you really need to be pitching over right about now. Exactly. Exactly. Um. Cool. Good answers, all. Alex, was there a question in the in the queue that that piqued your interest? Mm, someone was asking, I think, about dates for Falcon Heavy going up. Uh, I think the next one is going up on July. Then we have like that's that's going to be USSF forty four. Hold on, I'm going to bring up the the question here. There from. Uh, Claudio Taveras, I don't know that name. Um, yeah, we have USSF 44 on July, it seems. And then we have Psyche, which is going to be 
very cool, at least for me, because I love both the science of the mission and also the rocket. That that's going to be like a a, a really great overlap of the things that I really like. Um, so yeah, we we'll we also have Psyche on August right now, looking like the first of August, uh, and then right after that we have Viaset, which is looking like sort of late August, September time frame. We, it's a little bit you know right there because of the of the payload and everything. They they gotta get it ready. Um, it's also a commercial customer, so they might not have a lot of priority compared to, for example, Psyche, which has a uh, a planetary window. Then after that, we have USSF 52 and USSF 67. So, and those are going to be coming up on Q4. So yeah, we have a really, you know, very busy year for, for Falcon Heavy. And then we also have like another uh, two or three more in, in 2023 and then another two or three more in 2024. So we're going to see a lot of Falcon Heavies going up. That's what I like to hear. I like big rockets. Oh my god, dare I say it? I like big rockets and I cannot lie. I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say it if you didn't. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Cool deal. All right, well, on that slightly unprofessional note, we are joined by one of the more professional among us, Thomas Berghardt, News Director for NASA Space Flight. Thomas, you're out there, are you not? What's up? I am joining our coverage from here at the press site. How's it going, everybody? It's going. Um... I mean, how are you feeling right now? You're about to watch four humans launch into space in an hour and 32 minutes. What, what's the vibe? Give us a vibe check. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a beautiful early morning slash late evening, depending on your perspective. You know, really calm winds. It's a, it should be a beautiful morning for a launch. I, I was actually thinking on the way here that this is one of those things that's never supposed to become routine. But I realized that just a couple weeks ago, we saw Axiom-1 launch four astronauts to the ISS, and they just came back the other day, and now we're sending another four up. And it really is becoming a very regular thing to be happening over and over again. Um, not to say that it is routine, but it is something that's happening way more frequently than it was a couple years ago, and I just want to appreciate that. Nevertheless, I am still very excited for this morning's launch. Good stuff. Super excited to watch more humans fly into space. There's, I mean, there's no. is there any better... A uh, rocket launch than a rocket launch that is sending humans into space. Maybe a test flight, but uh, I'd say they're not better. They're just equally cool. Right, yeah. Human space flights are the top tier of uh, rocket launches, in my opinion. I would agree. So, yeah, speaking of human space flight, you all might have remembered that earlier I teased some new merch. Well, Pauline, in our... Oh, wait, no. Wait, okay, wrong wrong merch tease. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a pro at this. We have a new shirt that we debuted at the uh, during the Raptor side chat we were talking about earlier today. And it is a sweet Raptor Wrangler shirt. And gosh, I love it. I mean, it's, it's, it's snazzy. There's a mug, there's a, uh, like there's shirts, both male and female. There are stickers. It's an awesome design. Uh, I have not seen this Jurassic Park movie, so forgive me, everybody. <laughs> Somebody that has riff on this shirt, go. Well, I haven't seen the movie, but I can guarantee you, if if you see me around Starbase, I will be wearing one of these shirts because that <laughs> is what I do every day: wrangle them raptors. Uh, Nick, can I get a pledge from you that we will uh get a shot of you doing this gesture if you're ever surrounded by raptors? You know, if I ever turn around and there's a bunch of raptors coming at me, I guarantee you I will be making that that uh, that exact <laughs> thing. But I'll be doing my signature face, which is, uh, you know, very special. <laughs> All right, uh, good I stuff. I think for homework, you both need to see that Jurassic Park movie, but that's just me. Yeah, I, you're right. I do need to see it, um, but I still can appreciate that design. So yeah, if, if, another way to support what we do, if you all want to go buy a shirt or buy something else from the store, go check the store out. It's insanely helpful. Everybody that gets a a uh, piece of merch from us, it's yet another way, like I said, to support what we do, whether it's the membership program, hitting the like button, um, and whatnot. So I see they're doing Thank some, you. some work there. 
Yeah, are they are they working on the hatch area? What's going on there? Yeah, they're removing the seal between the Kriox's arm and Dragon. They have like a some sort of uh, flexible seal that they put up against the Dragon, and they're removing it. Ah, uh, got it. It's like the bumper thing, right? Hmm. So for someone who might just be joining the stream or something, you know, not that that applies to me or anything, can we get a status update of where we are in the countdown? <laughs> yeah. Who's going to go there? Go for it, Alex. Okay, me. Well, uh, you know, the, the crew exited the, the ONC building. You know, they suited up there. They went to the pad. Now they are inside the dragon capsule. Uh, they they were able to, to close the hatch. And we had a good lick check of the hatch. So now we are seeing them. As I said before, they are now removing the seal between the Cryox's arm and the dragon spacecraft. And soon we will have in about, I think... Uh, about a uh, forty-five minute. Uh, we we will have the go no go for for fueling. So yeah, looking forward to that. Sounds good. Yeah, those final checks out in the crew access time before the rest of the crew clears the pad. It's kind of that last step before the countdown becomes kind of just standard Falcon Nine countdown, right? The fueling procedure is exactly the same. You just get those couple extra steps right beforehand with the crew access. Oh, there we go. Things like that. Oh, nice graphic. Yeah, another thing that that doesn't appear there, but they sometimes, especially you know, when they show Jonathan Berger on stream, he usually mentions that. I think it's w around now, uh, T minus one one hour and thirty minutes. They flow some RP one through the engines. Uh, I have no idea why it is why it is that, but it's usually around that time. Uh, I, I'm really failing right now at remembering why they do that but they do it they do it because <laughs> the engines are thirsty and they need a they need a sweet treat of course um cool uh of course thomas in in uh in rare form here we have moldy space industries with the thomas fan club super chat so thank you moldy space hey i'm also hey, moldy space club. appreciate it and hope you're feeling better moldy yeah seriously sorry about the uh the little what was oh, that a, yeah. a car accident thing? Is that what happened? Yeah. Yeah, he's all right. Hope he's feeling better. Indeed. Gunfox61, thank you for the support. They say, is it possible to add the ISS, add to the ISS with a Falcon Heavy to extend the life of the ISS? Well, Falcon Heavy is going to be launching elements of the... Uh, what? Oh, my God. Thank you. The Gateway. I was blanking on the name for a second there. <laughs> the Blank Way. Um, so I imagine they could just as easily launch segments to the ISS on a Falcon Heavy too, right? Uh, yeah. In fact, when we were talking about the Axiom kind of extensions and eventual free-flying space station for the Axiom 1 mission last time, um, we were mentioning that the first module, which should get a launch contract pretty soon, will probably end up launching on a Falcon Heavy simply because it's a nice, big, and heavy payload that's going to low Earth orbit. That's kind of Falcon Heavy's deal. Um, so yeah, F F Falcon Heavy expanding the ISS is pretty likely at this point. Neat. Everyone just take a moment, have a moment of silence, take your drink, pour some onto the floor, pour one out for Bigelow. Oh yeah, <laughs> jeez. I'm just still sad been? about that, right? Hey, they've got hardware on the ISS though, and it'll be there for a while. That's true, and I think I've heard people say Sierra Space has some uh, some inflatable hab tech going on too. So yeah, hopefully that's not the end of that technology. I think the uh, the Nanorax commercial space station concept also had a big inflatable component, if I'm not mistaken. So the the, the inflatable habitats are not going away. Got it. Uh, and Cynthia Shelby Lane, thank you so much for the generous support there. A lot of generous support from everybody tonight. Can't go a moment without saying thank you to our Super Chatters, so thank you all so much for keeping our lights on here. They say, uh, how many tons of fuel are used to launch Dragon? I'm going to go with Alex on this one. Uh, <laughs> does, it, does it refer to the Falcon 9 or the Dragon? Because the Falcon 9, I think it, it has about 500 tons of propellant uh, i'm not sure how much of that is the yeah. actual fuel the rp1 
And then the dragon, I think it uses about three tons of propellants. Uh, it uses hyd uh, um, hydrazine and, and nitrogen tetroxide for, for propellants. So, yeah. Um, Always I, rough that's numbers, by the way. Just mind-boggling to me. 500 tons of propellant on Falcon 9. That, I guess, makes sense when you consider a starship is like thousands of tons of propellant. So, we're just like, ah, it's mind-blowing. It, it, it never ceases to amaze me, the scale of these vehicles. Even just Falcon 9, which isn't really, you know, it's no, it's no starship and super heavy. But it is not messing around. That is a lot of propellant. I wonder how many tanker trucks that is. More than I one. <laughs> At least three, yeah. <laughs> uh, perfect. I love the I love the the precision. <laughs> or wait, would that be accuracy? I don't know. Accuracy. That is one hundred percent accurate, zero percent precise. <laughs> thank you. And, yeah, thank you for that. About, while we're talking about the difference between like this the scale of all this, like the the dragon capsule is really lightweight for its size. Like we're talking about it being like twelve or thirteen tons ish, plus or minus a few. Uh, earlier and there's like crane weights out there that are like you know four feet by six feet by one foot of just solid steel that are heavier than that and it's like crazy to think that that much mass is you know it's a very lightweight spacecraft i'll have to say yeah it makes me think too like how heavy orion is uh that it it needs an sls to do the job exactly Ryan is chonk. Um, Muham, thank you. Or Mu no, Muhammad, thank you for the support. They say Godspeed Dragon Four. I guess it would be Crew Four, but either way, thank you for the support there. They say greetings from Malaysia. Is this that fun time where we tell the mods to take a quick break and say, "Where's everybody watching from? Where's everybody watching from?" We know Muhammad's in, in Malaysia. I'm in LA. Nick, you're in Starbase, right? Sorry, I had myself muted there. Uh, not Starbase right now. I'm in Brownsville, where I live, which is about 20 minutes away from Starbase, but pretty close. Good enough. I'll take it. Um, and, of course, Julia, Thomas, and Chris G are all out at the Cape there. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. Here goes chat. It just started, it just started going crazy. <laughs> Chris, B, Chris B says York, but working in dirty leads. I, oh, my gosh. Can you say that? Can I say that? Spain from here. <laughs> Colorado, Australia, Milky Way, another Colorado, Israel, Baltimore, Maryland, uh, Old South Wales, New York, Edinburgh, Sydney, Australia, Brisbane, Australia, Arizona. That's super cool. That's why we're so thankful when y'all are doing the super chats or what have you, because you're helping us to bring this stuff to ar people around the world, which is still mind blowing to me and still awesome after years of doing this. So thank you everybody for the support. Thanks everybody for tuning in from wherever you are right now, whatever time it is for you around the world. It's amazing to me that we live in the future and we can broadcast something like this to y'all. It's super cool. India, Sweden, Bulgaria, Adelaide, Fort Wayne, Indiana, Wayne, Cool deal. Gunfox6 says, One ticker truck hauls about 6,500 gallons or about 40,000 pounds of liquid. Somebody do the math. Somebody do the conversion. I'm not going to do it. Alex, do it. <laughs> Numbers. I don't know. I, I don't know about yeah. the imperial stuff. Even Numbers, what are those? <laughs> oh, man. All right, let's see. Trex is asking, do you know why they put two windows on Dragon instead of four? Who knows this? Answer this. Uh, Go. Uh, well, all right. Putting windows in pressure vessels is not super straightforward. Um, basically, you're just building in weak points to your thing that you're going to have to reinforce around it. Um, so less windows is technically a slightly safer pressure vessel or just more, more likely less work to make it safe. Um, because you can just have solid pieces around the rest of your... Um, but I don't know if that's the reason they have two versus four specifically. Cool deal. 
Uh, Stephanie's asking, how long does it take Crew 4 to get to the ISS? Uh, about a day, though. They, I actually, off the top of my head, I don't know if one of the folks back in the studio has the latest timeline in front of them, but it should be a, about a day. Copy that. Um, let's see. How many more flights are there in the commercial crew program? Asking Moonshot. Oh, man. So SpaceX, so the initial awards were for six each for SpaceX and for Boeing. And then SpaceX was awarded three ones up through Crew 9. So SpaceX has been awarded through Crew 9 and Boeing is through uh, Starliner 6. Uh, do I have that correct? I'm not missing any awards in there, am I? Alex, I'm yeah, looking that, at that, you. That was, that was a telegraphing to Alex uh, question. <laughs> oh, sorry. I, I was a little bit distracted. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, for, for commercial crew program, there are nine flights for Crew Dragon, and we are on the fourth operational one here. Right. And, and there's also six so far for Starliner. So we'll see. Um, we, we're probably going to be seeing another increase on those numbers soon. Um to be able to extend, especially if if they extend the ISS life all the way to 2030, we're probably going to see that in the coming years. Probably in a year or two, we we're we're going to see that. I hope they they introduce you know other vehicles like Dream Chaser. Can you imagine? That would be really cool. I can't wait for Dream Chaser lifting body gang. Lifting bodies are the best bodies. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> it must be late. <laughs> uh, the the quotes get better the later we get, Nick. Oh man, I had one earlier. I was gonna say, and then I I I tapped out. I hit the abort button, and now I've forgotten what it was. That's probably for the best. It's probably for the best. Try sending SEC to Ox. <laughs> <laughs> probably something nice. That's true. Uh. Mike, thank you for the support. They say hot jets. I don't know why they say hot jets. I guess we should cool our jets. Uh, and Muhammad, thank you for the support. They're becoming a Padrat member. Padrat, mem Padrat members get member-only emoji. You get preview stuff on uh, on YouTube there, photos and videos from you and Mary, Nick. Uh, from you and Mary, right, Nick? I, is that where the member videos go? I, I've been trying to figure out where the member videos go, but if I, I guess that makes sense if they're members, huh? Oh, wait. Uh, I guess I'm being told pad rats don't get the member videos, but either way, you get cool perks like the, um, uh, the like the uh, chat emoji. I'm good at this. Uh, Red team gets the, the videos and whatnot. Um, so that is how that breaks out. But there's different perks at different levels. Uh, Capcom and above is Discord access. Each level gets all the perks of the levels below it. You know how it works. Padrats get the cool emotes, though. So I'm going to throw a... Hmm. I'm going to throw grackle? a couple dragons. I'm going to throw a dragon. In. Oh, you can you can go... I'll do Grackle. I'll do Grackle here. Yeah. Gra grackle and dragon together. Grackle and dragon are best friends. They are. It's like it's, it's, like it's egg that it's protecting. Okay, that's enough emoji. Um, <laughs> it is. It's getting late. It's only 11.37 here, but I feel like... Uh, I feel like it's a good 3 a.m. I don't know. I'm getting... <laughs> I'm getting late night launch vibes. Here's one from an and asking initially the dragon was supposed to have a crew of six. Any idea why it was brought down to four and any chance it can get back to six. Wasn't it even like seven originally or something like that? What's go what's going on with crew capacity on crew dragon? Yeah. So both, um, f uh, both crew dragon and starliner were originally going to have, um, seven people able to fit on board. However, but NASA was like, okay, that's like great and all, but we don't really need seven ever. So uh, what they basically have done is, for SpaceX's case, they removed the bottom three seats that would have increased the capacity to seven and used that space for cargo and supplies for the crew members that are flying on board and also up mass and down mass capability to just bring cargo to and from the station alongside the crew. Um, so uh -huh. between those kind of trade-offs and the capability that NASA actually decided they needed, they did not need to transport seven astronauts at once. So um, 
they took out that capability. It, we also get the question a lot, would it be easy like in an emergency situation or in extraneous circumstances to put seven crew members in a crew dragon? And the answer is no. That is more or less not even feasible anymore based on how they've reconfigured the dragon design on the interior. Um, you would have to it'd basically be another rework to enable that. But uh, yeah. And the, the same thing basically happened with Starliner. Starliner was going to say, yeah, we could fit seven. And then NASA said, we only need four. So, yeah. Makes sense. And and, and kind of in that vein, is there any interesting like science Freedom, projects? Or up Close our team as the part of the crew arm. Freedom copy. Please. Thanks. All right, so the closeout team is clearing the crew arm, and they'll be exiting Complex 39A shortly. But anyway, they rudely interrupted you, Nick. Yes, yeah, so how dare they? <laughs> Almost like they're trying to launch a rocket or something right now. Um, is there any like interesting uh, scientific payloads or anything they're bringing up that we know of? Oh, man, that's a Chris question, but Chris is away from the mic right now, so we'll, we'll, we might have to circle back okay. to that one. All right. Yeah, that that question is precisely what Chris is for. <laughs> <laughs> the Sandwich Maker, thanks for becoming a Red Team member. Again, thanks to all of our members. Y'all rock. And Vi I'm not even going to try and say your name. I'm sorry. I would probably ruin it. But they say good luck with Crew 4. Or good luck to Crew 4. Uh, and they're watching from Malaysia. Awesome. Thank you for the support. All right, let's do some more questions as we wait for launch. An hour and 12 minutes to go. Can you tell I'm excited? Um, I, can't, I can't see you, but I know I'm excited. Definitely excited. Adam Greenhouse says, an excellent problem to have is a good name for a drone ship. That's three hours old at this point, but something that was said on the stream. <laughs> Kyle Trick is asking, can SpaceX launch a crew capsule in an emergency if need to get crew off the ISS? That's not really how it works, right? You kind of, the capsule you ride up on is your lifeboat if something goes wrong. Isn't that uh, kind yeah. of how it works? So from my understanding, there's some cool mission roles, rules for the ISS that uh, there always has to be enough seats on the uh, station for anybody who's on board. And so you'll see uh, anytime they have to do like a repositioning and move a, a capsule from, you know, like a dragon capsule from one of the, the docking ports to another one, all of the crew assigned to that, that, uh, that flight have to get all the way on the, on the dragon and fly just a few feet around because they have mission rules where uh, if there's a problem, they have to have enough seats uh, to get everyone down. So they don't have to fly one of these emergency missions. All right, cool. Let's do uh, another question. Alex, did you have one you wanted to do? Yeah, there's there's one by Kal El. Uh, Kal El, it's uh, Superman. It's Superman's uh, alien name or whatever, right? Isn't that what that is? No idea. I haven't watched. Okay. Those. Anyways. Yeah, you can you can basically bash me on, on chat for that, but I haven't. <laughs> I mean, now who those. hasn't seen the now who hasn't seen the movie? Aha! <laughs> the tables have turned. <laughs> Yeah, so they ask, I wonder how many times they can rework a capsule. Like, I guess they're, they're talking about the reuse of the capsules. And, you know, this is, this is sort of something that is always in work. They always are working on kind of extending uh, the number of flights that these capsules uh, can fly. And, you know, what, like the, the safety when they are comfortable with, a, with the amount of, of flights. I think I explained that a little bit bad. I'm going to rephrase that. Currently, uh, they are certified for three flights. The crew, uh, the crew dragons, and the cargo dragons are for five flights. But you know they have a lot of missions uh, going on. So what SpaceX said recently was that hey, we're gonna actually move that certification for the crew dragons all the way to five flights, just like the cargo dragons. And we should expect probably later down the line those two for both the crew dragon and the cargo dragon to move perhaps beyond those five flights to support, you know, the ISIS program all the way to the 2030s. Yeah, and, and they have a really good relationship with, with NASA uh, on that. And, you know, just like boosters, they have flown uh, 10, 11, 12 times 
they're going to be doing the same thing with, with Crypt Dragons. They're going to push the envelope, just keep pushing it, and, and fly more and more and more, and, you know, that's, that how, it, that's how it goes. <laughs> Neat. Oh, I was talking while muted. Yay! Uh, cool. <laughs> well, with that, are you about to head out, Alex? Indeed, I'm gonna head out. Uh, gonna take a break and uh, enjoy the launch by myself. But yeah, I'm gonna have to to leave you guys. Uh, yeah, it was cool. it was well, neat. It was a, a, well, a good a good stream for me. Yeah, you you were quite enjoyable and provided some awesome knowledge. So thank you for that, and also for providing the excellent spanish accent so there is <laughs> alex information on the screen me. go follow him check out their tweets his tweets all the good stuff um and yeah that's that thanks for joining us alex thanks bye <laughs> see ya all right let's see what do we have next here's kind of a softball one whoever wants to jump on it uh, Amiga clone is asking, what would it take to upgrade Slick 40 so that it could be used for crude flights? I could think of a couple things right off the top of my head. Thomas is unmuted. Wow. Thomas, you go first. Well, oh gosh. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, the obvious thing is a way to get people into the capsule. So you would need some sort of crew access tower. You, we saw what you and I launch alliance did at pad 41 to enable Atlas five to launch humans. They built a, a crew access tower, put a crew access arm on it. Of course, at 39A, SpaceX took a tower that was already there and just put their own crew access arm on it. Um, but at pad 40, it'd be similar to pad 41. You'd have to build a whole new structure that you can put an elevator in and have an access arm for dragon. You would also need on that tower to have some sort of emergency egress system. So if crew needs to escape the vehicle while it's sitting on the pad, uh, prior to pad abort kind of scenarios, um, you would have, you know, some sort of slide basket system, most likely, um, unless you're going to go the Ares 1 roller coaster ro route. And there you go. There's my Ares 1 reference for the day. Um, but some sort of pad escape system um, from the crew access tower. Um, but other than that, that's probably it, unless there also would need to be some sort of bunker, because Pad 40's never supported crude launches that I can remember. So um, you would also need sort of uh, protection bunker like 39 has, um, I think. Although, I don't know, is there one near 41 somewhere? Like, where does the crew emergency escape to? I'm looking at Chris, who's thinking about the answer. I don't... <laughs> <laughs> we have yeah, Chris back on comms now, too, I think. Sorry, what, Julia? And Julia might know, too. Was, well, someone here has got to know. No, I, I, there, there is no underground system, as far as I know, at Launch Complex 41. So I do believe they would just take the slide wire down and then take the armored vehicle out of harm's way. But I do know one more thing you need at Launch Complex 40 to make it human rated. Um, so. You need to actually have your foundation rated for human launches, and that one foundation? is, by the way. How does yeah, that work? Like, like the foundation. Like, like SpaceX actually checked to make sure the foundation was stable um, for crew launch. Now, does that mean maybe just because they would have to add a tower? Potentially. I, I didn't get clarification on what the foundation being rate, human rated means, but whatever it means, it, it means they could do it. Hmm. That's odd that you would need. Uh, I'm, I have questions. I'm huh? like the weight of a rocket. No big deal. But the weight of a rocket plus four humans. I don't know. Got to check that foundation. <laughs> <Completely different. laughs> well, I mean, you're adding there. in the. You are adding another tower. I, I don't know. Maybe it's just to make sure it's still, you know, we've had things happen on that pad. Rockets blow up. And just Maybe it's just to make sure it's not going to sink into this Florida muck. Makes sense. Well, perhaps they should have done that around Starbase, because I sure do watch them tear up foundations and concrete every day and then pour it again and tear it up the next day and pour it again. So perhaps they should take a hint. <laughs> You'd think. 
And that's the difference between a private spaceport and a multi-user spaceport that has government um, and regulations. Exactly. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> uh, let's see. Chris, do we have you back? Putting him on the spot. Talking while muted. Yeah, I, I think you might be muted, Chris. <laughs> he said indeed, but you didn't hear him. <laughs> Okay, good. Well, oh, at least... I was I was double muted. So, ha, huh, yes. <laughs> Ooh, now you're echoey. You're double voicey. Oh, nice. Shoot. Okay. <laughs> oh, now you're good. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Oh, perfect. This one has been marinating in the question queue for three hours now, and I was waiting because I knew Thomas was coming. Thomas. Oh gosh. <laughs> Colin is asking, "What is the most cursed rock?" No, I'm kidding. Uh, any suggestions for possible internships and opportunities in spaceflight for an aerospace engineering student? Oh, man. Okay, so if I'm going to assume this is on the spaceflight side of things, um, there's obviously many sides of aerospace engineering, some of which have nothing to do with rocketry. Um, I'm going to answer what I know most about, which would be spaceflight. Pretty much any major contractor that you see involved with the space program is a big enough company that they will offer some type of like internship program, SpaceX, ULA, Blue Origin, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, Lockheed. Um, yeah, obviously NASA has a huge internship program. There's also specifically, I can recommend the NASA pathways program, which is more or less an internship program, but you are, it is also tailored towards giving you a path towards a full-time position at NASA. Once you complete your, a degree so nasa pathways program highly recommend looking into that but otherwise there's also kind of more standard nasa internships and then like i said all the major private companies that work within the space program um all, almost all of them offer some type of internships things even smaller companies like some of the small side companies I, I off the top of my head i know rocket lab virgin orbit astra um i think firefly too i think all of them have some type of internship program as well um you can also look at satellite uh, companies i know there are plenty of spacecraft manufacturers that also do internships so honestly it, if you th have a name of a company that you've seen thrown around in the spaceflight industry google them and find their careers page 99 percent chance there's an internship page on there um, and just apply anywhere that even remotely interests you because you never know what opportunities will come from that Good advice. Thanks, Thomas. Anybody else have anything they want to chime in on that uh, respect? Don't think that internships are not important. They really oh, they do important. give you a leg up massively. Very good point. Thanks and we that, say Chris. that having me myself as an aerospace engineering student, never having done an internship. But <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> no. okay. I've been a little busy with this company called NASA Space Flight, but you know. <laughs> well, that's you true. skipped. You skipped the internship part. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there you go, Colin. Hopefully you're still listening, or hopefully you tune in uh, and catch this. Good question. I mean, we talk about being excited to get people hyped up about. Uh, the like space flight in general i think the like top tier of that excitement that we could engender in folks is getting people to want to study this stuff and then get in the industry and then further the state of the art and have more pe smart people working on these hard problems so that they're no longer hard problems so that is definitely super awesome good luck to you Here's one for Julia. Brett is asking, is the booster landing in the same area of the ocean as usual? I guess usual is relative depending on the, on the mission, but for a crew launch, is the, is the drone ship location sort of standard or what do we, what do we think about that? Yeah, that's, it's pretty standard. So we are looking at it being Northeast, just a little bit farther South than a Starlink would be. Uh, maybe about 50 to 75 kilometers uh, south of that. So um, crew mission boosters do tend to get back to port just a little bit faster than a mission like Starlink when Starlink launches north. Makes sense. Cool deal. You know when it's a fleet question, I got to ask you. Oh, no problem. You know what I thought was really cool? When we were making the transition from LZ-1 landings to drone ship landings, and we had the just barely offshore landings, those were kind of cool. 
You don't remember that, do you? Wait, wait. I was reading questions for the queue. I'm terrible. What, what, say it again. I'm sorry. I'm an <laughs> awful person. Oh, what was cool was when we, we went from LZ-1 landings to not quite all the way out there drone ship landings. So we had drone ship not very far offshore, to be honest. The, the um, close-in oh, drone ship right. ones. Yeah, we had a couple kind of close ones, which were, were pretty cool. So, Wasn't there one or two of those on the West Coast as well? Yes, there was a drone ship landing like right off the coast of Vandenberg. It was a technical RTLS, but they landed on the drone ship like like 10 kilometers out to sea. I remember yeah. that. I remember seeing the, uh, the, the landing burn for that just barely and being like, wow, that's crazy. It's basically right there. Yeah. I forget what mission that was. Oh, man. It's kind of uh, crazy see. that we've gotten to a point that we have to think really hard. Um, <laughs> since I love since it. COVID, I've taken over 60 selfies with boosters that have come back to Port Canaveral alone. So that kind of says something about Cadence. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah. yeah. Well, I believe to d today is the 149th flight of a Falcon 9. The... 89th reflight of a Falcon 9 booster, and it will be the 109th attempted recovery of a first stage. Wow. That's wow. To put that in perspective, yeah. So, yep. how many years and to those numbers are what we're talking about with Starship? I don't know. Well, it's, you know, 100 something recovery effort, you know, <laughs> coming up on 200 yeah. launches. Well, if Elon has his way, that'll just be November. No, oh, geez. No, it's two weeks, Chris. Did you get the memo? It's two weeks from now. Oh yeah. Two weeks. It's always two weeks. Uh yeah. If you haven't seen uh Total Recall, go watch Total Recall after this. Two weeks. Um anyway. <laughs> hey, it's a Mars related we're just, space. I, I, we're just growing a list of movies that everyone should have watched. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. Uh, when NSF movie night. Oh, there you go. It needs to My happen. Question is, why NSF movie night when we have rockets to look at well into the evening? We can do both. I mean, Por que los, no los, or whatever the phrase is. You can have Por two screens. Los. One we just need rocket. to get a big projector and we can project it onto on the rocket. Mm. Uh, even better. No, 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 uh, no. I have the best place to project a movie on. SpaceX, it's right behind me. Orbit tank oh. isolation valves equalize low flow pressure. Copies. That's a call yeah, I that, haven't heard before. Yeah, it sounds like they might just be cycling some valves that aren't necessarily part of standard procedure, but is a standard check for something that they saw or something like that. Um, they didn't call anything as off normal or anything, so just something to keep an ear out for, I think. It might have, especially if they're cycling valves and things, that might have been a heads up like, hey, crew, you might hear a bunch of valves do a bunch of stuff. Don't freak out. It's, you know, expected. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and too, it would probably pop up on their display screen. <laughs> or, or stuff like that, yeah. yeah. That, it, that is true. They, they, when they did have to cycle things in the shuttle era, they would call the crew and they would say, expect a caution and warning alarm in the cabin. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Also, what was it for before Axiom undocking? Like, they were looking at some, or the crew said, hey, so there was this weird thing on our displays, and then Hawthorne does something, and then the dragon called back, whatever you just did, it fixed it. So yes. it's kind of that relationship. They turned it off and on back and on again. Right, yeah, of course. <laughs> it's what it does every time. Maybe I'll stick also, So I'm sorry, you can also tell we have reached the less than one hour ahead of launch yeah. time because... Thomas Freedom is now Space standing. Is Julian is... Go for <laughs> section six. I can, when you're ready, please report go for launch. Copy. Freedom is go for section six. And uh, that work. I also totally... Oh, oh, yeah. You can tell we're under an hour because Julia is pacing... And Thomas and I have begun standing and walking around. So you can tell we're getting close to a launch here. I am fidgeting with a USB stick because I have to do something with my hands. Yeah, I I'm just, just can't too sit anymore. 
<laughs> Take that beach chair. Um, let's see. Maybe on a stick is asking, do we know the status of the vertical integration facility for Falcon nine? Um, you know, I the, believe the, but they, that, that we was haven't like an NSS seen it. contract, right? Yeah. Um, if we're asking if we've seen construction of it out there, I I can't say no. I have. Yeah, the the basic status of it is it ain't being built yet. And do we, uh, does someone want to talk about what that is really quick? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is um this is to be able to integrate payloads vertically onto the Falcon 9. Um, so right now all of the payloads are integrated horizontally inside the horizontal integration facility, but some Department of Defense and big... SpaceX, freedom is go for launch. Go for launch. That's like we want to... That's freedom, what we want launch. to... That is what we want to hear. But yeah, some of the big DOD spy satellites and Department of Defense satellites cannot be integrated horizontally. They have to be integrated vertically, which is not something the Falcon 9 can do. So in so they won some of the U.S. Space Force bulk contracts. They won 40% of those uh, last year. And some of them will involve the need to... A, have larger payload fairings, but also have this vertical integration. So this vertical, mobile vertical integration facility is coming to 39A because basically they'll assemble the Falcon 9 in the horizontal integration facility with everything except the payload, roll out to pad A, go vertical like you see them here now, and then this big mobile servicing structure will roll up to it, and that is how they will put the payload on top of it um, when it is out at the launch pad. And if you're wondering what kind of thing might need vertical integration, think like a large mirror, maybe something with a very large mirror that you don't yeah. want to have to build the structural strength in the satellite uh, to enable it to support the weight of such a large mirror in a horizontal orientation. You only want it to be able to support that weight in a vertical orientation. And so you can save weight on the structure itself because in space, there is no up, down or horizontal or what have you. It, those forces are benign. So, um, yeah, like big optical spy satellites, that kind of thing. Or for at least, you know, one bucket of things that would want to be integrated vertically. Yeah, you can go to a lot of different spacecraft that are very sensitive with either their instruments or just their structural designs to putting their own weight, you know, which because they're designed to operate in an environment where, like you said, weight isn't really a thing. So... You need to be able to support your weight in at least one dimension so you can be mounted onto the rocket. But other than that, um, if you can get away with by integrating the payload in that orientation, then you can make the rest of your spacecraft lighter uh, by not building it up for the other orientations. Makes perfect sense. Cool stuff. So yeah, it sounds like the VIF is not going up yet, but we will certainly have eyes on it when it starts to. Uh, Marcus Miller is asking repeatedly, do you know if the NASA astronauts flying on Dragon get the same astronaut wings that the Inspiration4 crew got? What's the whole deal with the astronaut wings? Um, so the deal with the astronaut wings is basically if you fly an orbital mission for NASA, you're getting them. Um, and that would, would include all of the other... Um, professional astronauts who fly aboard the Dragon. Suborbital flights are no longer getting them unless there is a really, like, historic element to it per what the FAA has said. How are they handling orbital flights, Thomas? Um, I don't, off the top of my head, know if there's any specific distinction between if you're flying for NASA or if you're flying to, let's say, Axiom, or if you're flying as part of Inspiration 4. I mean, I know all the members of Inspiration 4 got wings, but going forward, if you look at, say, Polaris, I do not know if there's any distinction between those different kind of categories. Um, I believe they get some type of wings, but there might be differences as a astronaut versus a government astronaut. So I'm not yeah. going to claim to know one way or the other. 
I'm, I'm fairly certain, and don't take my word super seriously on this, I'm fairly certain that if you uh, fly uh, on one of the NASA programs and you get NASA astronaut wings, but if you fly on like Axiom 1 or, uh, you know, uh, Polaris Dawn or whatever, you'll get uh, wings issued by the company that flew you. So you'd get dragon wings, and if you flew on... Uh, Blue Origin, you'd get Blue Origin wings, or you know, uh, mm. any of the other providers. So they 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 have kind of gotten out of the business of issuing uh, commercial astronaut wings, and I think that program ended with uh, uh, was that Inspiration Four? Who was the last uh, non NASA uh, commercial crew? Yeah, I mean, assuming there it was not active for Axiom, which obviously just came back, then yes. Yeah. I, I again look look up the program yourself, but but I watched a YouTube video two weeks about it, so I'm an expert. <laughs> <laughs> like that. Tithia is asking if we were to go into space, where would we most like to go? Oh, like us specifically? Yep, I'm gonna say Mars. Easy. Let me go to Mars, please. Thank you. I'm gonna stay Chris? inside of a pressurized, temperature controlled capsule <laughs> in a space suit. <laughs> You know, nice. Nick, that's a very good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Just to be clear here. <laughs> so in terms of destinations, this should be no surprise for anyone who listened to NSF Live this past weekend. Enceladus or one of the outer ice giants. Yes. Yeah, uh, uh, Julia? I, you know. or Th- no, Thomas, go ahead. Fine. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I'm under the assumption that Nick made clear that I would be in some sort of protective spacesuit that would keep me alive. Um, I think either Europa or Enceladus, being able to actually see what's under those oceans would be pretty cool. So either of those uh, um, moons with the, the ice shells and liquid water underneath sound pretty cool. Nice. Julia? You know, I'm going to be the basic one, and I'm going to say the moon, because I would like to moon. visit our historic sites on the moon. That would be awesome. Can I be uh, your plus one, Julia? Absolutely. Oh, thanks. Cool. If Wait, like, I went to either the moon or Mars, you would. I would definitely enjoy going to a place where we have like a robotic lander sitting and just go see it on its new on its new home, if you will. That would be pretty cool. Just like climb up on it, put a quarter in the slot, and ride the <laughs> ride the ride like one of those kitty things. That works. Yeah, right. Totally. Uh, Nick and Thomas, like, what universe are you guys living in where someone's gonna snap their fingers and teleport you to whatever destination the you team say is ready without, for a, crew without a space arm suit. retract, propellant loading, and launch for non-urgent no-go conditions. Brief the CE or LD and then approve aborting the countdown. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operator shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control abort the launch auto sequence immediately and proceed into the launch abort sequence. At T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off, relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Operators advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fire is imminent or occurring per Dragon manual escape flight rules. In the event of a fire alarm, key operators noted below will remain at their post while the alarm is evaluated. In the event that personnel safety is threatened, evacuate to the south-facing emergency exit, which leads directly outside. Launch control, you may proceed with arming the crew for movement. All right, 45 minutes to go before launch. Crew arm is going to retract. Yeah, that, that was the standard call-out. safety briefing. Yeah, like, it's a very cool briefing to get, because that is basically a call to all the controllers. All right, this is where it gets real. All These are the safety briefings for the rest of the channel. MCCX. The control will be in a lockdown state until launch escape system is disarmed. So yeah, the next visual milestone is going to be crew acts this arm retract, which should be coming up here shortly, and that'll be followed by the arming of the launch escape system. Sweet. So let's take a little bit of time then to... Oh, sorry, so I can hear myself on Thomas's mic. Crew big. access arm retraction has started. So with the crew access arm retracting, let's take a little bit of time to talk about the rocket and the vehicle that we've got today. So the crew capsule is new. 
Uh, it is the Crew Dragon Freedom flying for its very first time. And it is riding atop a brand new second stage rocket as is customary for all Falcon 9 vehicles. And it is flying on booster 1067-4, meaning that booster is making its fourth flight today. It previously launched the CRS-22 cargo flight to the International Space Station and the CRS-3 uh, and the Crew-3. So CRS-22 and Crew-3 missions last year uh, for NASA. And then it launched turksat 5 b and it is here today for its fourth flight. Uh, Falcon 9 will be heading northeast from the Kennedy Space Center uh, with the first stage uh, heading for a landing on a shortfall of Gravitas, uh, which is stationed off the coast of the Carolinas, about 500 kilometers northeast of here. Uh, so in a nutshell, that is our vehicle today. The basic ascent profile will be a rough two and a half minute burn of the first stage. Uh, before handing off to the second stage. Uh, the second stage will then complete the orbit insertion for Dragon into a roughly 200-kilometer circular parking orbit. And at that point, once the liftoff phase is complete, um, about nine minutes after liftoff, Falcon, uh, Dragon will stay attached to the Falcon 9 until a, for a, a couple more minutes until about the 12-minute mark after liftoff. And that is just to let propellants settle down in the second stage so that when they actually separate Dragon, there's no accidental recontact between the stage and the spacecraft. Makes sense. Lots of fun milestones coming up. Let's see. Andrew, thanks for the support. They say, good morning from Stockport, England. Good luck, Crew 4. Stockport, oh my god, I've complete. I've been there and I have a story about it, but it's not germane to space flight. But I've been there. I know where that is. <laughs> well, well, now I want to know the story. Uh, all right, so oh, the crew got, access I, I arm is retracted. Train, basically. <laughs> nice. Okay. Like the train took you to the wrong place, or you were on the train and you're like, which car am I in? Uh, like there's a Stockton and a Stockton, and um, or Stackport <laughs> and Stockport, and I saw one and just assumed that I had read the name wrong and got on the wrong train. Oh goodness. Um, but thank you for the support there, Andrew. Gino, thank you for the support. Asking who wants to be on Spin Launch's first crude mission. That's a joke. Uh <laughs> no. not thingy it. sling shuttle spam capsule. Yeah, not it. Although I will go see Sling Launch or Spin Launch uh launch their sling thing launch. if I can. <laughs> sling launch yeah, my brain. I need more coffee. Uh and Vig I, I'm not even going to be able to say your name, but thank you for the support. They say Danish. Let's see. What else we got? Is it like a, like a Danish? We got a, is that a Danish fund? Um, let's see. And David, thank you for the support. They say, love the coverage. Just want to say good luck. We're all counting on you. That's solid airplane. Freedom good SpaceX luck. We're all for launch escape. Freedom standing by. This time I can give you a go for Section 7, Close Visors, and Arm Launch Escape System. Okay, Freedom Copies. Our visors are closed and we are arming the Launch Escape System. Sweet. Okay, visors so are from closed. this point forward, should any emergency arise on the pad, Crew Dragon can safely abort and bring the crew to safety. Good old Crew Dragon, being such a bro, being like, I got this. I'll get us out of here. <laughs> All right, let's see. Ian is asking, the ISS has a visible pass over my house in Cincinnati about an hour and a half after launch. Will Dragon be high up enough to be visible as well. Dragon, SpaceX, launch escape system is verified armed. Where is the location again on the ground? Freedom copies confirmed. All right, launch escape system armed. Uh, they're in Cincinnati, and the pass is an hour and a half after launch. Hour and a half after launch, they're in Cincinnati, Ohio, so that would be... 
I mean, we were saying earlier that it would take Dragon. Has, yeah, so you, you might be able to see it. Very, It would be very faint, but you might be able to see it. We were saying uh, earlier that it would take about a day for Dragon to get to the ISS. So would it even be close to the ISS or just like a, a dot following the ISS quite a ways later? Or what do you think that would look like? Um, so Dragon... Okay. Dragon would be trailing the ISS pretty significantly just that shortly after launch, but things in space move pretty quickly. So it you know, from the ground it might seem like, oh, it was like right after the ISS, even though it's like gonna take them almost a full day more to actually get there. Um the but so it's it's possible I wouldn't necessarily count on it. It will be a pretty big gap between the two spacecrafts at that point. So actually, I, I did see a CRS-22 uh, before it docked with the ISS one evening, and I was trying to figure out what the heck was trailing the ISS, um, but it was it was a, a CRS-22, but mm. uh, it needs to be a really big magnitude uh, uh, viewing and, and flyover, so you'll have to do a little bit of research to, to see what your location looks like and what timing and stuff. Another shout out to Flight Club, which is an excellent resource for such things. Flightclub.io. Yeet. Here is another Talking question. Propellant tanks will be venting for propellant load in approximately one minute. Heads up, if you hear crazy sounds, don't freak out. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> But man, this is this is that moment where you start to get really into the business end of this countdown here as we're like two and a half minutes away from propellant loading um, onto the Falcon 9. And yeah, this is the moment when you get the chills and it starts to get real. Yeah, it really is. And speaking of, how about we take a moment and go back over the crew on this mission, Crew 4. Uh, the farming sim guy is asking who was on this flight. Yes, so uh, four astronauts are on board this flight. Um, two veterans, Commander Shell Lengren and uh, Mission Specialist One, Samantha Cristoforetti, uh, have both flown long dura- uh, each have flown one long duration stay aboard the International Space Station. Um, uh, so they are the veterans, and they are joined by two rookies in Bob Hines, who is serving as the pilot for this mission, and Jessica Watkins, who is serving as Mission Specialist Number Two. Um, uh, in terms of the two rookies on board, um, Bob Hines is a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Air Force, and uh, Jessica Wat- Watkins holds a Ph.D. in geology, and um, she will actually be the first black woman to perform a long-duration stay on board the International Space Station, and only the second black person to do so as well. So a major milestone there as well. Super curious if she's going to be doing any sort of geologic type work on the ISS, whether that's observing the Earth or doing some sort of experiments. Do we know anything about that? Um, so, yeah, so we'll get a little better idea of like some of the other experiments that are going up on some of the cargo, <laughs> excuse me, on some of the cargo flights. But um, geology is one of the things that she will be focusing on um, through some various Earth observation Um uh, experiments that 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 she'll do up there. Yeah, it's like why why choose a geologist? I like the choice, uh, and it has like Apollo vibes. Um, but yeah, that's interesting. I like it. More scientists yeah. in space, please. And geology does make more sense when you consider that she's part of the Artemis generation, and you know that all, all of those types of scientific needs that we'll have once we return to the moon these are the astronauts who will be starting all of that as well. And there's a really concerted effort from NASA, um, uh, a really concerted effort from NASA to fly all of these astronauts who will do the Artemis missions before they actually do the Artemis flights themselves. Yeah, that makes sense. Sort of how uh, Apollo, a lot of Apollo astronauts flew on Gemini first. Pellet load has started. Yep. Ah, there's the word we really like. There's the phrase we love to hear. Propellant load has started. The Falcon 9 is being fueled. Yay. Let's get that fuel in Falcon 9 and get these people on their way to the ISS, please. 
As uh, Rob Navius often liked to say for shuttle launches, the quick nine and a half minute commute to orbit. I I mean, it, it makes me think, you know, it's really not that far. Like a 200, 100 mile or like high up orbit. It's just not far at all. It's right there. I've, I drive 200 miles in a day. Easy. No problem. I, if only I could drive straight up and get to space, I would do it. I would do it every day. <laughs> what I absolutely, oh, me too, same, same. But what what I absolutely love about that when you say it's not that far away, um, there are a small little group of islands. Uh, they are the most geographically isolated islands in the world in the South Pacific, um, thousands and thousands of kilometers from the other nearest landmass. So when the ISS goes overhead or comes nearby, there are times when the people who live on those islands, the closest people to them, are living on the International Space Station. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty nifty. Neighbors, I like it. <laughs> neighbors Thanks for neighbors. like a couple minutes at a time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're here. They're gone. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of things that are here and then gone, we have like thirty Starship plushies left. So just gotta point that out. If you want a Starship plushie. We are really getting to the bottom of the barrel. We saved a number of them uh, for, you know, friends and family and for taking merch photos with and stuff like that. Um, but we have opened up that final, final, last little bit of reserve plushies, the private reserve. Uh, I wish we could do like a special tag for them or something like a black label. This is a private reserve starship plushie. Um, but really, <laughs> we're... We're really almost out of these things. So if you've been eyeing the Starship plushie, I know we've talked about it a few times, at least since it came out. Uh, we had to order a big batch of them. It took forever. I think it took like three months or something. It, I mean, it, uh, after the point that we got, uh, you know, a design finalized after some back and forth and proofs and all that, like it was a lot of work that went into this. And we got the big order and it came in a bunch of crates and it had to clear through customs and it was a whole ordeal. So... We might order more at some point in the future, but as of right now, I don't think we have any plans to, and there's about 30 left. So if you want a Starship plushie, get it now and forever, or forever hold your peace because I and will be seriously bummed if like two weeks or three weeks or whatever from now, someone DMs me on Twitter like, hey, I really wanted a Starship plushie, but I didn't get one in time. Is there anything you can do? It's going to be like, no, we, we totally cleaned out the entire last of the private reserves. So if you want it now, get it now. So you're not grumpy later. And as part of that signature reserve collection, each one of those Starship plushies was hugged by me personally. Definitely. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> They're previously hugged. Hopefully that's okay. Hug proven? <laughs> Hug proven? Oh my god, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Thomas is on I'll the ball tonight. I'll, I'll be here for like another hour or something. <laughs> Great. I think that means you just send up to do the launch callouts. Oh, oh wait, great. you can't because you're on because you're on I, site. You know, you'll you'll be, be getting. I'm gonna be yeah. yeah I'm gonna be camera operating actually, but you know. All right, fair. You've you've lucked out this time. Well, Michael um, hasn't replaced me with a robot yet, so I gotta like crew the camera. Or has he? And you're just like in a Blade Runner situation, and you don't know that you're a robot. Ooh, <laughs> Tesla oh, bot. Bum, you know? bum, bum. I think this is the first time I've been here where three of us at different times have operated one cryo video cameras. Been. Cool. Stage one, what was that? Cryo load has begun? Something like that? In... Uh, yep. Oh, and we can see venting. We can see some venting. Uh, uh, some little vapors from the base of Falcon 9 there on that first stage. Excellent. Yeah, that's pretty it's cool, Julia. You're saying together. it's all coming up Millhouse. Um, <laughs> yeah. You're saying, Julia, this is the first time that the three of you have all been operating the camera at one point or another for a launch. I, I suspect, given the cadence for this year and the plans we have in store for just continually increasing the quality of our content, that you know this won't be the first. There won't this won't be the last time that that happens. So I'm glad all three of you are out in force and providing us these awesome views. I know Steven had a little bit of a of us of some sniffles or something, so I'm sure Steven would be out there as well uh, if he was able to be. Or maybe he is and I don't know that. 
Uh, he 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 is resting and recovering. Yes. Yay. Well, feel better soon, Stephen. We love you. Um, Musical Wolves asking if Starship is part of the commercial crew program. It's part of the human landing system program right. for Artemis, but it is not part of commercial crew, right? Correct. Correct. It is that something that they bid at any point? At, it, ha- it hasn't been officially bid, but it, SpaceX has put out there, and in fact, you can just go to the SpaceX website to their Starship page and ISS, you know, Space Station Logistics is 100% a proposed use case for Starship. So should there come a time where it is appropriate to bid Starship for either cargo or crew logistics to low Earth orbit, SpaceX has already indicated that they would be willing to explore that possibility. Some, uh, who is it? Somebody in chat is asking how big the Starship plushie is. I think it's about... Uh, like what, twelve inches or more? It's like the size of my it's forearm. It's like more or less a foot tall. Yeah, about that. It's it's a good size. It's not uh, quite life size, starship size, <laughs> but it's big enough. Yeah, we need a scale, like a one fiftieth or one ten thousandth or whatever it is. It's it's less than one. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick pinging me in the wrong channel and saying it is 12 inches tall. Thank you, Patrick, even if it was in the wrong channel. I really hope he, like, got the ruler out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, while I was saying that, I was looking for my tape measure, which until, yeah. like, yesterday was right in front of me on my desk. And, of course, now it is in the cat dimension because who knows where it went after the most recent cat salvo across my desk. <laughs> uh, let's see. Anthony is asking... On stage one, how many of the engines gimbal, please? Uh, all of them, I believe. The center engine might be mounted in a way that it has more gimbal range, and that's not specific to the engine. That's just whichever engine gets mounted in the middle, that mount might have a slightly higher gimbal range. But all nine of the engines can gimbal and are used for steering during ascent. Awesome. I love that they said please, too. Like, how how kind? Like, it... It reminds me of the old Nickelodeon magazine commercials. Nickelodeon magazine, please. Anybody remember that? Am I old? I'm old. Old. I, I remember it. I remember Jack. <laughs> Yay, we can be old together. <laughs> well, I mean, um, we, we grew up together. We're the same age, so we should remember the same things, at least from pop culture. Yep. Indeed. Uh, let's see. IQ Workshop asking if we'll see the jellyfish this morning. We will not. I mean, most yeah, likely too not. Too early. That is, dun, dun. if you guys don't know what the jellyfish is, that's the plume interaction of the Falcon 9 and, and Falcon 9 second stage at separation and uh, in that sort of area of launch because viewers in shadow and sunlight that the rocket flies into, it's a whole thing. You, you know, we, we've heard us talk about it. You know, if we hadn't sprang ahead an hour, then that might have been. But, you know, it, it, it's daylight savings time and all, so sorry. Everybody in the chat now express your displeasure with daylight savings time and go. <laughs> oh, give me a soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> you you're literally standing on a soapbox right now, Chris, talking to uh ba 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 3300 people. So, feel free. Um but, <laughs> but but I know you're just kidding. Um Here's one from Robert what enhancement would a modern space station have over the ISS that would not be immediately obvious? I mean, my immediate gut reaction to this is uh, more volume. I, I've t- we talked about this, I think, on the Raptor side? Or was it earlier on this Thursday chat? Everything's blurring to together. Time is a flat circle. Cryohelium loading. But yeah, I always think of I always think of uh, Skylab and the footage of the astronauts flinging themselves around on Skylab all willy nilly with all the room they had up there to do somersaults and whatnot. So, um, I, so, I would just want more internal volume. But I don't know. What do you guys think? What enhancement would a modern space station have over the ISS that would not be immediately obvious? Faster Wi-Fi. Nice. Mm. Um, I think that would be immediately obvious. Maybe. Um. I mean, just better ease of maintainability or maintenance. Like a lot of the crew's time on the ISS these days is spent doing maintenance. And with all the knowledge that we've learned from occupying low Earth orbit for over 20 years now, 
I think new modules will be designed with some more resilience in there where less maintenance is necessary. And then also some of that maintenance may be made easier by either, hey, we have these tasks that normally require you to conduct a spacewalk to do maintenance, but we've rerouted cables and put panels in certain places where crew can conduct that maintenance without conducting a spacewalk, which would ease operations, things like that. Those kind of lessons learned um, would would be best applied because that frees up all that other time for scientific research and exploration and technology development purposes. Thomas literally said everything I was going to say and not improve. <laughs> Trick says RGB lighting in our back channel. I like it. I mean, um, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> everyone knows. Everyone knows that RGB makes it go faster, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Some speed holes? Maybe a big giant spoiler? Gotta get the go faster stripe on there somewhere. Maybe some yep, chimes. Yep. You can put some yes. chimes, <laughs> chimes and strakes. Just all the things. <laughs> and strines and shakes. And we'll get a Dr. Seuss book and then we'll make it. Uh, anyways. Uh, good question there. Alan is asking, is there anything else other than humans on the ISS? Is there like a whole bunch of tardigrades or I know there's like some plants and things. What, what other, Ooh. I assume they mean living things. Yeah. I mean, Cause of um, course there's other stuff than humans on the ISS. There's human waste and water and oxygen and you know, all kinds of things, bacteria. but <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, yum. I, I, there's almost always some type of plants up there. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know about like animals. If sometimes there's mice up there, sometimes there's you know things like tardigrades and things like that. But off the top of my head, I don't know of any currently. I don't know, Chris. Do you remember? Um, there are sort of always those types of biological experiments going on. Um, in addition to the animals, you said flies are are big ones um, that get used a, a lot because their life cycles, um, their life cycles are short enough that you can actually over the course of a very short mission like a two-week mission you can get multiple generations so you can see how um adaptations to zero g and microgravity environments are passed on for successive generations up there very quickly um we use a lot like that we use rodents a lot because they're good stand-ins for cancer research i mean technically cancer cells are alive so um and there's a lot of cancer research that goes on on the international space station so um yeah also, depending on how much we blur the line for what's alive and, you know, counting towards this question, there are some robots involved with the ISS. Ah, yes. Um, the, I know the ESA has a couple, one or two of those, like, really small ones that kind of just float around. Robonaut is not on the ISS right now. Robonaut's down back here for repairs, isn't it? I believe Robonaut came back, yes. It, it came back a while ago, but it hasn't gone yes. up yet. So Robonaut's not up there right now, but um there are some ro robots up there so i and i don't know does canada arm count like i don't know well, i was gonna say if we're, if we're gonna talk about the robots we gotta shout out canada arm and dexter um right and, and everything they they definitely are testing ai um there on canada go. arm and dexter in preparation for canada arm three and the uh mda canadian arms that will be on, or will that will hopefully be on some of the upcoming lunar rovers as well so you but know, we probably back... diverged a lot from what the question was actually right, asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're into the Cylons be nice to us part of this, like when the uprising happens. I like that part. No, way, I don't. <laughs> Not the uprising part, but the be nice to machines. Part. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. That, there you go. Hey, it's that time where we have to fulfill our contractual obligation to point out the T minus twenty minute vent. The uh, nominal purging of the transporter erector lines that indicates we're about 20 minutes away from launch and that the countdown is proceeding nominally. Stage nice. 2, RP-1 load is complete. Uh, that's exactly what I was just going to say. This is why there they purged go. the transporter erector is because they finished loading RP-1 kerosene into stage 2. So they have to purge those propellant lines and inert them and get the second stage ready for densified liquid oxygen loading, which we'll pick up here at the T-16 minute mark. Uh, for the first stage, both densified liquid oxygen and RP-1 kerosene are flowing simultaneously into that booster. And basically, the Falcon 9 is fueled up until three minutes before liftoff. And 
that is how they do it. It is a process called load and go. Because you load it and then you go. True. But on Check it, out. it reminds me in some ways of set it and forget it. I don't, I don't know oh why. Oh my maybe, gosh, yes. <laughs> maybe because I spent too much time parked in front of the idiot box. But yeah, it's load and go. Hmm. Um. Let's see. And of course, I I gotta make Das happy and say we get it. Falcon Nine, you vape. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But this is really the business end of our countdown now. Um. So not not only are our propellants being loaded at this point, but very shortly the vehicle will begin configuring itself for liftoff as well even before the final configuration takes place at the t minus one minute mark um we will have various parts of the rocket now actually getting ready for the liftoff here good deal and i'm seeing in our back channel that we are down to 21 plushies so fun reminder almost you know, 20 minute vent, 20 plushies, give or take a couple left. So <laughs> we can do it. We saying. can do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gosh, the look of the locks just cascading wow. out of the vent like that and the lighting and everything and the lack of any wind. It's just that what a yeah. gorgeous sight. It really it is the, the lack of wind, the lack of real prominent wind today is just making this spectacular. It's Good just it's beautiful. The vehicle is like a living thing that has come to life and is stretching its limbs, sort of stretching its vents <laughs> for, you know, the sprint into orbit. It's so cool. Indeed, and the only rocket that actually fuels when its human payload have already been added to it. Yep, that was a whole big thing with NASA not being comfortable with it and SpaceX having to do all kinds of things to assuage their fears. But I'm glad it worked out because it, it makes sense. I mean, they're in the capsule. They're safe. The capsule can get away from a detonating stack if that was to happen. So all is well. Not to mention that for the load and go procedure that SpaceX does, the launch escape system is armed for the entirety of propellant loading. Whereas for any other crewed vehicle, when the crew is boarding, the vehicle is already loaded and the launch escape system is not armed because you can't arm the escape system till the crew access arm pulls away. So... When you think about it that way, you could very easily make the argu argument that this is way safer, but that's a rabbit hole that we don't have to necessarily go down. But it's one worth saying. Yes. That they're totally safe throughout the entirety of the fueling process, yeah. Let's see, what else we got here? Keep the questions coming. We're T minus 16 minutes and a 16 and a half minutes away from Stage launch. Stage 2 lock load has begun. And I was right about to say, uh, yep, as Christy pointed out earlier, that's 16 minute mark. Here comes the locks load to stage two. Excellent. Everything is on track. Uh, but yeah, thank you, Tommy, for the support there. What else do we have question wise? Colin is asking about stage two. When does stage two re enter? Colin asks, does it burn up completely? Re-enters fairly quickly, usually a, a couple of orbits um, mm -hmm. uh, af after after launch. Um, no, all of it does not burn up in the atmosphere. Um, there are portions of it, uh, internal tank structures, some elements of the engine that are built to withstand temperatures greater than what they will experience during atmospheric re-entry that do survive, which is why they always purposefully deorbit the stage the second stages over the open ocean and away from shipping lanes um thomas helped me out i think it was last year there was a falcon 9 second stage that had failed to do its deorbit burn in orbit and it ended up coming back in over washington state yep. and portions of it didn't survive to the ground yep. that they found after yeah. that yeah but the most obvious ones to find were they found some copvs the composite overwrapped pressure vessels because um, those are pretty resilient uh, little structures. So, yeah, parts of it do survive. It's a big enough structure that, again, with some components built, withstand some pretty high temperatures that uh, the stage does not necessarily entirely disintegrate during reentry. Um, so, yeah. 
And hey, Chris, you said it is purposefully deorbited. So mm -hmm. it goes in the open ocean. And would that be to a specific area even that is kind of like a graveyard? They don't always necessarily. I know exactly what you're talking about, Julia. So um, there, is a, there is a place in the Pacific Ocean called the Spacecraft Graveyard because it is basically where we aim defunct spacecraft that we can still control for atmospheric reentry. We aim it over this area, the South Pacific, because it's basically absolutely devoid of shipping lanes. Um, but for the Falcon 9s, they come down into the Southern Atlantic, the Southern Indian Ocean. Um, they, they sort of come down just based on where in the mission do you have to reignite the engine because right. of the batteries on the second stage are, are yeah, running I'll... low and, and things like that. It's, it's more driven by by the actual performance needs of the stage than it is a specific area that they target. Yeah, the the big difference there being a, an upper stage, you know, they designed those battery components to last a flight profile. And like, uh, you know, a satellite or something like that that needs to get deorbited where that's been operating on orbit for years. And yeah, they can pick an orbit that goes over that, like you said, that actual graveyard point that is used very often. Upper stages usually don't have that luxury because the battery would die first and then you'd have an uncontrolled reentry. So um, sometimes, the, the oftentimes, the Falcon 9 upper stages end up in the ocean, but not necessarily that specific location. See, I and, learned and something one, new. <laughs> and, and one of the interesting interesting things, so um, one of China's former space stations, their singular module Tiangong stations, um, uh, before the Tiangong multiple module that they have, multiple module station that they have now, one of those was actually doing an uncontrolled reentry uh, a few years ago. And we were sort of watching it because same thing, like parts of it could survive uh, atmospheric entry. I remember and I was it, on a plane during that and I like got yes. on the plane. And they were like, it's going to come down probably while you're on the plane. And I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> yeah. And by sheer happenstance, it came down in the Pacific Ocean graveyard. Yeah. <laughs> Which, 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 to be incredible. fair, you know, if you pick a random point on the map, the odds are you'll hit the Pacific Ocean. But um, except if you're a meteor works. coming into the atmosphere, in which case you tend to target Russia. Oh yeah, for some reason, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are just weird coincidences like that, you you're know, right. of just land masses and and how how you know what percentage of Earth is covered by what. Um, but there are really weird coincidences like. Russia and asteroids and spacecraft just by happenstance coming down into that graveyard. <laughs> yeah. Fascinating. It'd be so cool to take a sub to the rocket graveyard and just scoot around and look at because oh, people wow. people do scuba <laughs> wow. diving on uh people do scuba diving on old shipwrecks and whatnot and like artificial yeah. reefs like oh yeah I, it's probably way too deep and the items are probably way too far apart because the ocean is huge but hey don't take this away from me let me dream how cool would it be <laughs> well, I mean, um, also you're but... looking at the remains of something that's also re-entered so it's not like giant chunks of spacecraft are there it's kind of like the pieces that survive but jack you can come here to Cape and go to the snark infested waters. I mean, Ooh, those haven't true. necessarily deorbited, so you could find some mm. treasure off of this coast. Mm. That would be the strategy, actually. Julie's got a very good point. Yep, yep. Uh, my, my, my vote is we, we start the NSF uh, defunct satellite museum on the bottom of the ocean uh, around <laughs> Point Nemo. Let's do All it. All right. There we go. <laughs> uh, I was going to say somebody make a mod to KSP where you can go do that or something. I don't know. Ooh. Uh oh, you know there's going to be someone out there now. <laughs> yeah, sure Peter. enough. Um, let's see, Stephen Shoup, thank you for the support, becoming a Capcom member. Thank you so much to all of our members for helping us do what we do. I've said it multiple times on this stream. I'll always say it multiple times on this stream. You get cool perks for supporting us, and you enable us to do some more like long-term planning. Thank you so much to all of our members, and thank you to Stephen for becoming a new member. As we hit. Do I just leave Freedom, our space broadcast? Please commit. confirm crew displays are configured for launch. Freedom confirms displays are configured for launch. SpaceX hey, copies Jack, crew you four, right? and on behalf of the entire SpaceX team, we are honored to have you aboard Dragon Capsule Freedom today. It has been a privilege working together to prepare for this launch to the International Space Station. We wish you a great mission, good luck, Godspeed, and time to let Freedom fly.
Woo. Heck yes. Hey, copy SpaceX. We'd like to take this opportunity to extend our thanks to our NASA, SpaceX, international partner teams, and most of all our families for getting us to the threshold of this amazing opportunity to launch to the International Space Station of Kennedy Space Center. A heartfelt thank you to every one of you that made this possible. Now let's let Falcon Roar and Freedom Ring. Nice. Falcon Roar and Freedom Ring. I like that a lot. It's it's got it's got a nice ring to it for sure. Alright, T minus eight and a half minutes roughly to go. Oh, just under nine minutes to go, actually. Take that back. But there's also a delay. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, if you want, I can walk closer to the countdown clock. <laughs> You do you, Julia. We're so close to launch right now, I'm not going to tell anyone to do anything other than please sit back, relax, if you can, as people fly into orbit, and uh, enjoy the sights and sounds that we're about to provide you of people going into space. So do we have we have two cameras out there right now, right? Um, and we're going to be shooting with both of those, and we might have views from Fleet Cam and all kinds of cool stuff that everyone uh, being a member and supporting the channel is able to to allow us to do. Uh, okay, really quick, uh, as we're getting into the final moments of the countdown, we do have another piece of new merch. Surprise! It is the Human Space Flight shirt. Is that what we were doing? Or are we doing the... Are we doing the there we go. It's the Human Space Flight shirt. It's awesome. It's a new design made by Pauline. Ooh. It's delightful. It features uh, worm-like text which is always good because worm is the best and Wrong. go check out. It is, it is. It's it, worm, so the, the, the order of, of, of bestness is worm, then uh worm ball, then meatball. So that's, oh, uh, that, that's, a, that is official. You heard that here on an official NASA space flight broadcast. Anyways, <laughs> it's an awesome new shirt. Go check out NASA space uh, Sorry. Go check out shop.nasaspaceflight.com. Get that shirt. If you like it, go get the Raptor Wrangler shirt. If you want it. get one of the last 20 plushies, if you want it, all that stuff is huge in supporting what we do in the same way that the membership program is sort of our bedrock. The uh, store is another part of our bedrock. So yeah. And I will not repent. Worm ball better than worm. There's, oh God, no. Worm ball better than meatball. Oh yeah, you messed up. No. <laughs> and I talked over a, and I talked over a call out. Look at me go. <laughs> All right, we are getting really close here, folks. Looks like the dragon's just breathing over there. I love it. It really does. Yeah, that's awesome. It? So at this point in the countdown, Falcon 9 is in chill down. So what that means is that they are allowing some of the super cold densified liquid oxygen to come down into the initial fuel lines uh, and propellant lines of the engines, the nine Merlin engines at the base of Falcon 9's first stage. And that allows them to be properly thermal. Stage one, RP one load is complete. So that there is not a cryo shock event, basically a cryogenic temperature shock event at engine ignition, so that they're already at the temperature they need to be for ignition. So that is underway right now. The other major elements in the final part of the countdown, um, around four and a half minutes, we will have the transporter erector pull back to 88 and a half degrees uh, in its pre pullback position. It will then pull back and throw back to 45 degrees at liftoff. Um, but then at T minus one minute, as we continue down into the count, Falcon 9 will enter startup where the propellant tanks will actually fully pressurize for flight and Falcon 9 will enter its auto sequence or startup and formally take control of the countdown. That then leads to staggered start engine ignition at T minus three seconds. Um, and then a liftoff at T0, which is 3.52 and 50 seconds this morning. Oh, darn. I can only be here till 49 seconds. I'm going to miss it. No, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Let's launch some people into space. Just imagine. I, I like to do this for crewed launches. Just take a moment and truly just Dragon really try and put yourself... For terminal count. Falcon 9 tanks are pressurizing for strong back retract. All right, uh. that is all good stuff. Imagine yourself sitting on the in the Dragon capsule right now, in your suit, strapped into your chair, after all the training, all the work, 
all the will you or won't yous, getting selected as an astronaut. All, I mean, so much. Just imagine sitting there, getting ready to launch into space, getting ready to mm-hmm. feel the G of Falcon 9 push you into orbit. Has started. Stand by for alarm. It's got to yeah, be a wondrous feeling. Yeah, and it, it, just an interesting comment there, Jack. Jared Isaacman recently said when talking about his first trip on Inspiration4 about how most of the countdown is just sitting there being really, really bored because once you board, there's all that extra schedule margin where you're probably not going to end up doing anything. But now, once you get to this part of the countdown, you go, oh, right, we're launching to space, and I think the nerves start to kick in again. Yeah, I mean, as someone who has watched and photographed rocket launches in person and on streams, it's kind of... Obviously, a much smaller version, and you can see the uh, the little arms there on the on the strong back retracting, and this, now the strong back itself will move back a little bit. Uh, it's the when you're shooting a rocket launch or when you're waiting to watch one happen. I'm sure our viewers know we've been live for like four hours now. There's a lot of hurry up and wait, and there's a lot of uh, you know w- sitting around and waiting for the thing to happen. And then once we get into the into the terminal count here with just minutes to go, you really start to feel the adrenaline. So. Here we go. I mean, this is it. People are about to launch on this brand new dragon into orbit and rendezvous with the ISS after about a day. So and, just moments away. And speaking of that, um, I believe that that is our cue for Thomas and I to hop off of comms and man our cameras so that we can track this because there is not a cloud in the sky. So awesome. this is going to be awesome uh, today. Yep. So, so right, um, whoever, I will whoever be does a better track... Perfect. Enjoy the launch, and uh, thanks for the views you're going to provide us. Whoever does a better track gets a cookie. <laughs> See you on the other side, Jack. Ooh, I want a cookie. <laughs> I have instructed Julia to uh, provide the winner with a cookie, and I didn't actually until just now, but Julia makes good cookies, so maybe she can make that happen. I, I'm sure I could make that happen, Jack. All right. With that, I will let you all get into uh, position and ready for this launch. About two minutes away. So excited. Nick, are you excited? Dude, I am getting hyped over here. Like, we've been waiting for three hours, just enjoying our company, and it's all coming down to this next few moments here. Let's go, Freedom. Let's go, Dragon. Awesome. Just under two minutes away from launch, give or take. And so we are going to see another... Purge, I think, that might be happening here or about to happen. There we go. That's similar to the T-20 minute vent purge that we know is nominal and expected. That is nominal and expected. Everything is looking good. Everything is progressing. A minute and 30 seconds to go. I just can't get over how alive that rocket looks sitting there. It really does, and for some reason more so than normal. Maybe it's the lack of wind, or I'm not sure, but it really does look like a living, breathing organism that is just about to just chuck people into space, which is so cool. Chuck them very accurately into space. Very carefully, precisely, but also energetically into space, yes. And safely, but yes. Safely, thank you. Um, Let's see here. I mean, this is, this is it. Make sure you... Uh, have your audio set appropriately. I will shut up for launch so that we can hear it because it will sound awesome. But yeah, it's about 30 seconds to go, give or take. Godspeed, Crew 4. Twenty seconds. Fifteen. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Ignition. Nice. And liftoff. And you can hear Chris G losing his mind. And now let's listen to Falcon 9 as it pushes four crew members to the ISS.
vehicle is now passing through max Q. I don't even want to talk over it. That audio is so spectacular. I know, right? You can see the exhaust plume from the nine Merlin engines expanding as Falcon 9 ascends into thinner and thinner air in the upper atmosphere. And MVAX oh, chilling. MVAX chilling. Always get... Uh, yeah, whoever whoever uh, mixed up that switch right there, or that fade. I always get uh, Saturn V vibes at this stage of flight with that crazy like shock cone, if that's even what it is, down trailing the stage expanded one, exhaust plume. Stage one throttling down, and we're about 10 seconds away from main engine cutoff on the first stage. Nico. That'll, that'll be at uh, 2 plus 236. And Ish. Miko. Alright, there's Miko. Confirmed. Stage SEP. Nice. Stage 2 Alpha. MVAC ignition. Copy 2 Alpha. Looks like good ignition on MVAC. That tensioner band that we always see fly off has flown off. We got an awesome view on the left side there from the first stage inside wow. the plume of the second stage. That's beautiful. Wow. That reminds me of the uh, that fairing footage that we saw that, that at one time. That I think SpaceX or Elon tweeted out. That was gorgeous. Yeah, that was. Oh, that was so, absolutely phenomenal. Great work to you and Thomas. I'm not sure who gets the cookie. I think maybe both of you get cookies. Uh, every cookies all around because people are going into space. Well, Thomas can get the cookie because he's actually still tracking it with his camera. Uh, Excellent. Oh. It got a little too far away from 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 mine because he his has the bigger Was zoom. It signal Bermuda. That was just incredible. I mean, like the the, the crisp, the slight Dragon crispness, crisp nominal trajectory. Nominal trajectory. That's rate of copy. Oh, nominal trajectory. Fantastic. Yeah, the like the cr the slight crispness to the air and the humidity that was in the air. I mean, just amplified the sound, and an incredible amount. That really was just a gorgeous, or amazing. I don't even know. I can't even talk. The crackle from those rocket engines was absolutely flawless. Uh, really, is. really great audio tonight. Now, here's the thing that we can watch for because it is actually clear. So this is part of why Thomas is still tracking rock solid this thing because we will see the entry burn um, mm. as they head toward the drone ship, which is 600 kilometers downrange from here. Um, for the first stage, it's clear. So we will Amazing. see that happen from here. Incredible. Amazing. The first stage entry burn starts at T plus 728, according to the timeline that I have. So Dragon, SpaceX, coming up, nominal trajectory. In just a few minutes. We have copies. Nominal trajectory. Acquisition signal. Poor people. Poor people having the ride of their lives. Indeed. Uh, there is just something magical to There's just something magical about watching that little dot on uh, in the sky. And knowing what it is and knowing who it's carrying and as it's just inching itself closer and closer to orbital velocity, it's there's just something indescribable about watching that. And seeing the ISS uh, fly over is cool enough knowing that there's people on it, but seeing a rocket shoot through the air that you know is under like, you know, propulsive power, I don't know what you want to call it, under rocket power. Dragon, uh, SpaceX, nominal trajectory. 
quite amazing. Freedom copies, nominal trajectory. Nice. I love hearing from the cockpit as they're uh, as they're flying, rocketing, whatever. Nominal trajectory is my favorite call out. Yeah, that's a good one. Go, go, crude broomstick, go. Ah, <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. All right, we're at T plus six and a half minutes, just about a minute away from first stage entry burn. Which is good. Thomas is still tracking. <laughs> Thomas, uh, you're a legend. So he's got it. So I I'll just take this opportunity. Barely. Go ahead. I was going to say, I can still barely see it with the naked eye. Dragons. There you go. We can see it. Trajectory. We can see it on Thomas's feed. This is the part where it starts to move really fast relative to your position. Yes. Just about Standing 20. Pick up that entry burn. It's about 20 seconds away. This is my moment to say that Ares 1 is the most cursed rocket ever. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mess with the boy if you want the track. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, I almost feel bad, but I don't. He he still got it. He still got it. And entry burn start? Question mark. There it is. There it is. There it is. I see it. I see it. I see it. Let me see if I can find it with the camera now. Flight termination system. That's crazy. Stage one entry burn start up. Ooh, nice. There it is. And uh, way to go. Oh, Good acquisition, got it. Got Thomas. It. Got it. Beautiful. And entry burn shut down. A little bit of delay on the SpaceX feed there. Ah, oh, so cool. Nice. Way to go. Crazy amount of velocity. Stage one entry burn shut entry down. Burn. And now you can see it happening. <laughs> All right, so that second stage is nearing its final velocity. Here we're looking for about 27,000 kilometers per hour on the velocity of the second stage. That altitude looks just about right. Terminal guidance. They rose up to and came down and terminal guidance means that the stage has locked on to the solution in its guidance program to actually insert into the desired and planned orbit. Super awesome to see the grid fins on the left on the on the first stage booster sparking or ablating or whatever as Falcon 9 encounters thicker and thicker Shannon. atmosphere. Copy Shannon. Copy Shannon. Stage 1 transonic. Ooh. Transonic. And here in rapid succession, we'll have the second stage engine cut off and we'll have the first stage landing burn start. Zico. Zico! Yes! Stage Bingo. engine cut off. That velocity looks good. Excellent visualization there with the globe and showing you where the positions of everything is. And there's the drone ship! Come on, oh. stable video! You can do it. You can do it. Come on. I love this scene when the drone ship just appears under the booster. Come on. Come on. What a Look beautiful at shot. That. Look at oh the my clouds gosh. it's going through. Ooh. Ooh. There's the ocean. There go the legs. There's something. We're over the barge. Looks like it. Yeah, hey. landing! Hey. Right Wallace video. Head. All the way down. That was amazing. Dead center. Fantastic. Nice job. I think yeah, I'm I'm so uh, nice. I'm certain at this point that a shortfall of gravitas is my favorite drone ship, if there was any question. Oh, oh, the oh, oh there's the zero G indicator. It's a monkey. I see a monkey and I see a, a turtle. Monkey. I see a turtle. Yeah. Are there two zero G indicators? Is that legal? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, where's Offsides. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Shell has the turtle, and um, oh. and um, Samantha has the monkey. And then yeah, nice. I wonder if European zero G indicator and American Stage one landing bird. <laughs> Dragon SpaceX nominal orbit insertion. Nominal orbit insertion. That's what we want to hear. Wow. They are on their way. Woohoo! Uh, you know what I think this is? I, I, I We'll see what they say. I, I would imagine that the ZRG indicator, because the turtle is um, uh, uh, Jessica and, and Bob, are their astronaut class nickname is the turtle. So I'm pretty sure mm. that's why they brought that. But I want to hear the story about why there are two. <laughs> 
most definitely. This is crazy. Two. Yeah, yeah, but uh, a picture perfect ascent so far. Only one step left, and that's to separate Dragon from the upper stage of Falcon 9 and let Dragon free fly on its way to the ISS. And that'll be coming up pretty soon here. And I guess you can throw the nose cone opening in there too. That happens right after separation as well. I'm still just like mind blown about that. That landing footage was gorgeous. And uh, Alex in our back channel says 40 second landing in a row since the last landing failure. 42. Woohoo. That's a good That's number. The answer to everything. <laughs> yeah. Also, a quick stat update because SpaceX has now delivered 26 different humans to Earth orbit. Mm. Wow. That's astounding. Wow. 26 humans in less than two years. Wow. That's incredible. I love how the zero G indicators are tethered to them. <laughs> yeah. Well, because they'd float away, obviously. <laughs> Dragon SpaceX. Dragon, Dragon separation, separation confirmed. Beautiful shot. Wow, wow. that look, looks like a Star Trek copy. ship going into warp. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, that is gorgeous. Lens flares. Chris Nolan would be proud. Yeah, mm -hmm. look at that. Wowie, wow, wow. Well, Wowie, wow, go. wow, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, well, there you have it, folks. Four people successfully orbited from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. That makes eight people who have left that launch pad in the last 19 days um, wow. on two different Falcon 9s and two different Crew Dragons, but the same launch pad. So we can officially say... It took from 1985 to 2022 to and do it. Finally yeah, did sure. two missions off, two crew flights off the same pad again for the first time since October of 85 here. So, you know what? Wow. I, I dare say that is bonkies. That is bonkies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I thought you hit your quota for that, Jack. <laughs> you know, I had to do it. I, ha I had to do it. It was, it was sufficiently bonkies. Is this overtime uh, bonkies? Yeah, precisely. Cool. Well, we got the zero-g indicators. We got them safely in an orbit. We have them getting ready to head to the ISS. Well, I mean, they're already heading there. So this is great. This is exactly what we wanted to see. It is indeed. And it's about 19 hours to phase up to the International Space Station for docking. So stay tuned later today. <laughs> no, just stay on the stream. We're going to be live for the next 19 hours, right? You yep, might I've be. <laughs> I've got a, a caffeine IV dripping into my bloodstream. I am seat belted into my computer chair and I am applying eye drops every 20 minutes so my eyeballs don't dry out. We'll be here for the next 26 Freedom. hours. LD, I hope you enjoyed your ride. It's been an honor flying with you, Chell, Farmer, Samantha, Jessica. Have a safe journey to the space station. Say hi to Crew 3 for us and we'll look forward to seeing you when you get home. Indeed, the dream is alive. Have some words from our CE. Dragon, see you privilege having you fly with us. Good mission. We'll see you later. Hey, and uh, from uh, Freedom, we want to thank a uh, big thank you to SpaceX, the commercial crew program, and specifically the Falcon 9 team for uh, a great ride. It is a privilege to get to fly this new vehicle, the Crew Dragon Freedom to Orbit. Huge thanks to the teams that assembled and prepared her for flight. We're feeling great and looking forward to the view. Awesome. Wow. Absolutely fantastic. And I want to point out one other thing that um, was apparently said to them, but I don't know if we heard it over the comm loops, um, that uh, agreeing that the dream is alive. Yep. We that is, yep. That is what was, that was the tagline for the space shuttle when it, when it, debuted in 1981 the dream is alive so i'm glad we're continuing that and just altering the dream a little bit as we continue to okay push freedom forward. copies uh equals activation complete we're gonna go visors up nice visors up time get a little more comfy Core copies here we go but yeah you're, you're right chris uh, i mean and i feel like in in a lot of ways this is uh this is sort of 
the promise that the shuttle, uh, dare I say, didn't really fully ever deliver on, deliver on is the this um, cadence is insane. The, ca- the cadence for the Falcon 9, yes. Yes. Yep. Um, yeah, the, ca- the cadence for the Falcon 9 is, is, is truly incredible. Um, yeah. I'm just sitting over here mesmerized. I, I, I love these shots with the earth in the background with like the end just gets gorgeous. All right, folks, well, you're looking at one of our favorite post-launch views, which is an empty launch pad, pad 39A, like Chris said, the second human space flight from this pad in under a month, just 19 days. Um, thank you all so much for joining our live coverage, though, from all of us here at the press site. Uh, if everyone wants to say goodbye, Thomas Burkhardt here. Thank you all so much for watching. Indeed, and I was, I, I, well, I was, I am. <laughs> um, I, I, I am Chris Gephardt, Assistant Managing Editor for NASA Spaceflight, and as always, an absolute pleasure uh, to be here, no matter the time of day, um, to bring you especially crew launches up to space. Wow, talking while muted. I'm, I'm good at this. So yeah, thanks uh, thanks for being on, uh, Chris. Always, always. And we had Julia too, but she might be editing photos already. <laughs> oh no, her phone's oh. just down to one percent. Oh okay. <laughs> well, we appreciate so you being out here, you. Julia. <laughs> Definitely appreciate all of the folks that are on site and have to drive back and forth to KSC. Also, uh, appreciate Nick. Thanks for being on commentary today. Yeah. Tonight. Thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, we'll try to eat some more spam next stream, but we'll make it work. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, you can check out Nick's info there. Give him a follow. Follow up on Starbase stuff, because that's where Nick is. Uh, always documenting the stuff going on out there every day. And, of course, we have uh, Thomas. Thomas, thank you for being on stream. Uh, always a pleasure, Jack. Thanks. And you can see Thomas's info pop up momentarily. There we are. Give Thomas a follow on Twitter if that's something you are inclined to do. Do we already do uh, Alejandro? Alejandro was on the stream earlier. Um, thank you to him for being on as well. And I think... Uh, Oh, yeah, Michael and Patrick also. Thank you, Michael and Patrick, for doing the background stream stuff, producing the stream, getting it pushed out to everybody. We appreciate that, of course. Very key, key thing there. I mean, without an operator in a control room, we're just going to be flapping our gums to nobody. So thanks for that. There's thanks, their info. Jack, for all of your commentary tonight as well. I yes, apologize absolutely. for none of it. <laughs> but yeah you're you're quite welcome i always love uh doing these launches and especially the crude ones it's really special so thank you to everybody for uh for watching i am jack buyer i think that's it good night good morning wherever you are around the world thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one Yikes. You bet. Incur. We don't need any more of these.